got a way better feel there. Um, so that's what's going on. And it's ago. getting worse. Like it's not changing. It's changing, but this just keeps happening. It keeps increasing, and people keep not saying anything or knowing what to do with it. So, so, we'll see. Um, so that's basically what's um, what the deal is. Uh, as we kind of go through our our spiel, we're just going to play some awesome photos of our different events uh, over the year. Um, so yeah, it's not really a match, but PowerPoints with like a bunch of words are not as awesome as photos of students. Um, um, yeah, so why, why is student union? Um, so obviously, should FPSU is really fucked up. Um, you know, should at higher universities everywhere is really fucked up. That's why we're all here. Um, so when actually the Naval Spring happened, um, we like uh, actually Emily, uh, one of the original organizers of um, a student group that she started called Staff the Student Action Coalition. Um, in 2012, we kind of didn't feel like PSU was really ready um, to just, bam, like start the school year with a student union. Um, so we started small. So Emily, Christina uh, were two of the founding members of staff. Um, and we really focused on direct action, getting students engaged, getting students just to know and pay attention to all of the things that we just talked about, like all of the shitty statistics that you guys are passing around. Um, most students at PSU don't even know that this is going on. Um, like you guys saying, it's a computer campus, students are just not engaged. Huge school. Um, and also, um, we've been facing a lot of trouble with the student government. Not like, the people in it are great, but it's facing a lot of like legitimacy issues. The administration kind of, there's not a huge voter turnout at all, and so they kind of shove it under the rug, and they're like, oh, those little crazy kids are thinking a little bit. And so we really felt like they could not alone tackle these problems and get them out to students. And we, as like an outside body, as a non-funded student, we don't have these ties to the University of Money, so we could do the action that they can't do, and we can organize in ways that they were able to, and so we thought we should probably do that. Um, so the first uh, thing that we, so yeah, uh, Staff, we spent a year um, organizing a staff, um, kind of leveraging smaller wins, um, which we've been happy to talk to you about um, offline. Um, but in the interest of time, we're just going to roll right into the formation of the um, So, the beginning of this past school year, this academic year, wow, it seems like it was like a lot longer. Um, we decided, like, it seemed like the time to really roll out SUSU. Um, so we started with a petition. Um, we, when I say we, like, I mean like the four organizing members, um, which were originally staff, um, tried to um, jumpstart SUSU. So we started talking about like what issues students are actually already engaged in. Like what are the things that students are talking about. So obviously tuition. Um, also, admin salary pay, like I was just talking about, it's just growing and growing exponentially, whereas our tuition is growing and the things we're getting back for it are shrinking. Um, union contracts, all of our faculty and worker union contracts were um, up and to be renegotiated kind of like at the same time. Um, and of course, the administration was taking a hard line with those, just like they were with students. Um, they were trying to pass off less. Um, and the really big issue was our campus security team uh, was set to get become deputized, which means they would be sworn police officers, um, able and have to carry weapons. Um, and the administration was planning, and I think they still are planning, on just scooting this through without any kind of vote, without any public information or anything. And it would take out $2 million of our students that we're giving it. So needless to say, this is something that students were willing to like sit up and take notice um, and actually give a shit about. So we started circulating a petition, which we uh, brought a few copies of so you guys can take a look. I'm not going to go into the details. 
But the basic upshot is no deputization without a student vote. Um, fair union contracts for all three of our uh, unions, the workers and both faculty. Um, an admin salary freeze for anyone making over 100 grand. Um, and an immediate tuition freeze. So we circulated this petition um, and we were actually able to get twice as many signatures on this petition than there was voter turnout for the student vote. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I want to just kind of run through one of the major ways that we did that, because I think it has been consecutively one of our most successful organizing strategies, and I, like, we haven't heard too many other um, organizations utilizing it, but what we really did was like, reach out to our professors, because um, we're big mouths and we talk to our professors about all this stuff. Um, so we went into their class and we got our class, our classmates. Um, and able, being able to get that legitimacy from the professors to like basically like give us like a sign off. Like these kids are, these students are doing something that like these professors believed in and supported. Um, that was really key. That really gave us a sense of legitimacy in the eyes of the students. Um, it also gave us like a captive audience to, at which to talk to. Um, so that's been consecutively a really successful strategy. Um, and Leo will talk more about how we utilize it. Um, and the major um, key thing about the petition, not only uh, were we able to get our message out, not only were we able to get students start thinking about organizing, um, also by signing the petition, students were automatically counted as a member of C2. Um, originally, we were like, you know, how do we get our membership up? Like, you can't, you know, you can just go to students and say, hey, join the student union. But of course, the first question is going to be why. So doing it in this way with the petition in conjunction um, got basically accomplished two goals which was putting forth our demands, which we then were able to present to uh, our PSU president, Vivian Bell, um, and also build really, really quickly and effectively uh, union membership. Um, and the number one outcome was that um, they actually did freeze their own salaries, um, which was amazing. Um, So, you know, um, still, they did it. They obviously didn't give us any like credit or anything, but that's cool. That's really cool, like, they can have that one. And the major lesson that we learned was, like, yes, this petition was really key in getting our demands out to the administration, um, but we honestly didn't expect them to actually freeze our own salaries. Like, that was just like, a total bonus, you know? Like, that was never our goal. Our goal was just to gain legitimacy and to get people talking about the issues. And also, like we had initially thought, they would just ignore the petition and we would use that to get people really, really angry, um, which worked, even though they didn't totally ignore it. Really fantastic. Yes. Um, all right. So we built this legitimacy with the students by like meeting with them, by talking with them. We did a lot of outreach in the parks. We really tried to get students on board, but we also had to get our professors on board and to get us all in the same like channel. So um, like we said, the, the contracts were all up for debate. So one of the key things we did was have a student present at all of the bargaining meetings to that student. Um, like the 200 million hours of talking with the administration, of sitting in the, in the collective bargaining and the negotiations. And that really gave us this legitimacy with the professors like we care. Like, students are willing to sit there, they're willing to sit there with you, and we're all on the same side. So on that side, like the professors really started taking it seriously. And on the side of the students too, we now had like a student voice who could tell students what was going on. We didn't just have to listen to the professors, and the administrators as usual, but we had like students telling students like, this is important, we like, really care about this. And we could highlight the ways that our struggles were really similar to the struggles of our professors. So that we all want um, shared governance. And we want our professors to have say in the classes that they're teaching. We want our class sizes we want our student programs around and like 
by having a student there, we could really voice that. So we became pretty legitimate. The professors started taking SUSU and the work that we were doing really seriously. And knowing that they had like an ally and the students was really valuable for them. And we managed to demonstrate that um, by having a walkout. Uh, spring term, right when the, the contracts were right in the heat of negotiating, the administration wasn't really budging at all on any of the, the topics that the faculty really wanted to talk about while they were sending out emails telling um, all the students how unreasonable the professors were being, blah, blah, blah. Um, we were able to gain some legitimacy with the administrators by hosting this walkout. Um, and so, let me see, yeah. So we did the same thing. We went to classes, we talked to students, we reached out, and we were like, look, these are the issues that are on the table that like, we're actually discussing. It's not about that the professors want like, these huge salaries. It's not about that they want to like live in luxury like our university president or anything like that. And we really wanted to empower students to educate themselves and to educate all of us enough to become like walking billboards for what was going on. So, and we also wanted to stress that we aren't telling people to strike, we're informing them so that if the professors do go on strike, they can make an educated decision and they can decide for themselves whether they want to do it or not. So it became, it was really successful. We did a bunch of info sessions. We had a selling loop, which is probably like the most technologically cool thing that we've done in a while. How does that work? How well. Um, basically, you signed up, you texted the specific number, and you pledged to walk out. And once we reached a specific number, which was 500 students, a big text got sent out, along with little updates along the way that was like, we have 500 students, we're going to walk out. And it ended up, we ended up having 700 students walk out, and it was like the first action like that that had happened at PSU, and it was crazy. And, th and that way we showed the professors, like, if you strike, like, we got you, like, we can actually do this. We showed the students, like, look at what it looks like when uh, 700 of you walk out of your classes and join in the park block, which is the big We showed the administration, like, if the faculty strike, like, this is legitimate. Something's going to happen. And we made them, like, actually fear looking bad. Like, we got media coverage. We got them to be like, oh, no, we'll look like idiots if the entire school shuts down because we won't negotiate this fair contract. So it was really successful. And it just showed our solidarity. Was that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then in that way, we continue to like, leverage our support and escalate our tactics up to a point where it was like a legitimate threat. What happened with the contract? What happened with the contract negotiations? So glad you asked. Um, well, the faculty union ended up voting to strike. And the only reason they had any weight in that was because of our walkout. And it was like, well, not the only, one of the main reasons. <laughs> I like to say the reasons. No, but they had, a lot of the faculty actually did say that. Have told us that yeah, <laughs> there was, here, what was the number? 90% of faculty voted to. 96% voted Which is obviously a huge number. Um, professors at PSU are very, like, in the usually. But how they, yeah, the union is historically We did uh, sell fair contracts. We got um, most of our, okay, um, most of the, a lot of the faculty at PSU are on what's, it called, what's called rolling contracts. So every single year they get fired um, on Christmas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tacky. They call it the Christmas yeah. um, And then at the end of the summer, they may or may not get hired for the following year. So basically half of the time that they're teaching students at PSU, they have zero job security, and they're also looking for other work in case they don't get to have their job next year. 
working at other universities at the same time. Yeah, the cobbling together a full time situation with part time PSU, part time other universities, who knows what. Um, so obviously not a great learning environment, not a great teaching environment. Um, you know, a lot of times you go back to like get letters of recommendation and your professor has just disappeared. Um, class sizes keep getting bigger, professors don't know their students' names. I mean, you guys all know these stories, right? Like this is not unique to PSU in any way. Um, so uh, part of the settlement for the peer contracts was that we were able to get 80% of these rolling one-year contracts expanded to at least two years. So now they only get a Christmas letter every other Christmas. So, you know, progress. Um, yeah, um, one of the other major sticking points um, you know, mentioned this uh, something called shared governance. Basically, just having professors be um, on the decision at the decision making table in terms of issues of academic quality. That was one of the first things the administration went after, and one of the things that we had to fight the hardest to keep in the contract. Um, so, we've got some of that. Um, so, in the interest of time, um, I guess we're gonna wrap up and uh, let Emily talk a little bit about the challenges we face. Yeah. It hasn't been all. It hasn't yeah. been all, all amazing wins, um, but it has been incredible. We, I mean, we are a very young organization. We don't have a history of us in the United States, you know, like Canada does. Um, so we have accomplished a lot, but organizing is incredibly hard work. I'm sure all of you know that as well. Um, and we face, we face like a number of challenges. Part of our issue is that Portland State, being such a large university, um, is not invested in cultivating a sense of empowerment or participation in their society. They have a slogan, let our, our school slogan is let knowledge serve the city. Um, and they talk a lot of talk about participatory education models, um, but that's, it doesn't really ever extend beyond the classroom. There is no encouragement for engagement in decision-making processes uh, that affect our daily lives. Um, our tuition debt load is, uh, it averages like $28,000 when we graduate right now. Um, I think that scares a lot of students away from wanting to, or feeling like they can have a chance to, to make a change, but such a big number is so overwhelming that I think, I think that it feels, it feels so disempowering. It doesn't feel like there's anything to do about that. Um, because we're a commuter school, so many people are already distracted by family life, by their jobs. I personally, I have a child, I have a lot of family, I, I work, I, um, but I, I, it's, it's possible to stay engaged, obviously, because I, I've never been engaged, but that's been, it's been hard to reach students because there's so much else going on for so many of our, our, our student body at Portland State. Um, we also, we, our, our academic schedule compresses everything into three terms, three 12 week terms, and so we are often
as well, CCSF, UC Berkeley, and then other Cal States. Um, here's a list of all the other schools that have had students join our coalition, basically. Um, as you can tell, California is very big. We, we are the coast. So, so, so I'm, I'm, uh, so that, that is, that is a picture of, um, 
uh, a bunch of us who went to a city college, San Francisco, because one of the local struggles going on um, there is that that particular community college has been in danger of shutting down due to this accreditation body called the ACCJC. And it's very anti-union. It's um, pro-neoliberal privatization reform. So this is um, a quasi-like um, government agency that, that's sort of private and receives funding from the Bill and Gates Melinda Foundation, the Lumina Foundation, to um, look for schools that are violating um, certain regulations and then shut them down. But the city of San Francisco, Okay, yeah, never mind. But anyway, um, that's a picture of us on the trip and the Golden State Bridge is behind us. So, okay, so our long term goals are to, of course, try and strengthen um, relationships and solidarity across the state and connect with each other so that people at each individual school realize that their school's not the only one going through issues of, you know, too many adjuncts. Um, not enough student services like tutoring and etc. Too many professors getting laid off, fees going up every single semester. So tracing it from 1990, it's been a 300% sort of increase in the state of California at every tier. We also want to um, train each other to become organizers in, in that um, sense of the philosophy, not just activists. We distinguish the two words in that at least to me and Vanessa, I think an activist is someone who just tries to assemble people to a rally, and there's there's huge turnover and burnout rate, but there's no um, set, sense of like a long-term oriented strategy to not only you know make someone go or show up to a thing, but to actually change their worldview and to over a series of many conversations and interactions. Um, help educate and politicize them so that they truly understand why you're fighting for what you fight for. We also want to create intersectional spaces um, that help each other grow um, and of course um, connect this to the labor struggles and the, whole, the bigger social justice movement at large via direct and participatory democracy. We also want to democratize our school's um, governing boards. So we have a board of trustees or a board of regents at um, every single you know, university level. We also want to um, bring education back to um, you know, the time when it was literally free. And this will help you know, further change society at large once everyone has access to this knowledge and you know, educational process. So what we see um, as the, the main problems that um, stem from this uh, uh, attack on education and the privatization of education um, is that uh, the state continues to defund um, our campuses and our systems. Um, and there, there's also a direct attack on shared governance or democracy within our schools. Um, and this is usually implemented by hiring administrators at, at competi competitive salaries, um, trying to push education online, um, they try to uh, find excuses to close underperforming schools. Um, they cut campus services, uh, departments, um, and of course they keep on um, putting all of uh, the um, the cost of the privatization on students' backs. Um, and the outcome is usually a decline in, our, in the quality of our education, an attack on workers' rights. Um, it creates issues of accessibility and inequality um, for low-income students or students of color. Um, this also leads to uh, campus repression because of students that fight back um, and uh, because of the privatization um, that one of the symptoms of that is that our schools um, invest in companies that usually um, violate some kind of human or environmental rights. Um, so this wasn't always the case in California, as been mentioned before. Um, education used to be free. Um, so back in 1960, uh, there was a, a, an act passed called the Donahoe Act, which, which created the California Master Plan. Um, it divided education in California into three education systems. Um, the University of California system, um, which accepts the t top 10% of graduates. Um, the California State University system, which accepts the top 33% of, of high school graduates. 
and our California Community College System, which is um, all accepts all students um, and, and is more of a vocational um, or, or transfer kind of college. Um, all of these systems are operated um, or run by board, our Board of Trustees. Um, well, within the CFC, the Board of Trustees, within uh, the UC, it's a, a Board of Regents, and within the Triple C's, it's a Board of Governors. And all of these boards, um, they're, the people that sit on them are not democratically elected. All of these people are appointed by our state governor. Um, so we have no say in who these people are, and most of them are, um, you know, uh, are, uh, have ties to corporations that further want to privatize um, our education. Um, the only um, exception to this is that within our community college system, um, it's divided up into districts, and those districts um, can uh, vote for who their uh, local board of trustees are. So that's the only system in California that has some form of democracy. <coughs> but they're actually also trying to kill that, um, and we'll talk about that when we get to that part. <laughs> um, but slowly but surely, um, since that act was, uh, was passed, um, our education has started uh, to um, be privatized. Um, so according to that act, education was supposed to be free um, and it was supposed to assure the upward mobility for um, a students no matter um, what their economic background or um, racial or ethnic background. But starting around the 1960s, um, our wonderful governor back then, Ronald Reagan, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, that's when the student movement was pretty heavy um, in California. Um, and he actually said that one of the reasons that he wanted to implement student fees was to kind of teach students a lesson to make them appreciate the free education that they were getting. <laughs> so that's kind of like, that kind of started, started off the trend. Then in the 1970s, um, we used to, uh, education was heavily funded by property taxes. Um, but in 1978, they passed something called Prop 13, um, which basically cut that funding um, and capped uh, 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 the taxes that were earmarked for that to 1%. Um, and then starting in the 80s, um, a lot of the, the state general funds started to be diverted towards prison spending. Um, and now we hear a lot of this messaging about um, this new normal in higher education and how it's, we should just accept the fact that education is being private. So um, I'm just going to stick to 2009 and that um, year, even though you, you could track a timeline of literally occupations and, and strikes at all these California campuses every year since the 60s. But around 2008, the UC Regents proposed a 32% fee increase, which was very big and um, would have amounted to $2,500. In addition to laying off a bunch of staff and refusing to raise um, the salaries for any of the faculty. So we were officially, um, according to the state of California, in a one billion budget deficit. So public education has to be the first to go, even though banks were bailed out and other um, parts of um, you know, public services were, were not as heavily cut. So sit-ins, teach-ins, walk-outs, and occupations that were in conjunction with the Occupy movement were um, implemented during this year. We had a bunch of, yeah. Okay. Um, we had a bunch of um, actions at UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz, UC Berkeley. Nevertheless, there were still fee increases, so this, further exacerbated the tension at each of these campuses once students felt more and more in debt and unable to afford attending you know, school. So I just wanted to correct something that Min said. So um, these actions were not, did not have anything to do with the Occupy movement. This is something that stemmed um, completely out of the 2008 economic crash. Um, and um, yeah, so basically students and faculty uh, started organizing together within the UCs um, and they, they uh, were able to um, occupy all of these buildings, a whole bunch of students were arrested, and at the end of it, um, they had a list of demands, but not all of their demands were met. Um, actually, none of their demands were met, but what did happen was, was that um, then our then-Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger 
did comply to um, refund our, our education systems, I think, by like 100 million each. Um, so, um, so um, uh, during, uh, from 2008, 2009, um, because we had that small win, it kind of like demobilized the student movement a little bit, uh, but during that time, um, what was happening was that um, you know privatization was still happening, um, and the way that that was being implemented was that student uh, fees were slowly starting to be increased. Um, so at, after 2008, 2009, um, our board of uh, our governing board realized, okay, we just can't increase fees like crazy like that. We just can't go like. 32%, like we can't just throw the lobster in the boiling water, right? Um, we have to like turn it up little by little. Um, so what they started to do was just uh, increase fees by 5% one semester, by 7% the other semester. Um, by little, it was co compounding the fees. So if you really did the math, it, it ended up being a 23%, 32% fee increase. Um, so students and faculty started to realize that, um, and they started to get pretty pissed off. <laughs> Um, uh, during that same time, uh, a lot of uh, our faculty unions um, and staff unions, um, their contracts were also up for renegotiation. Um, and our, again, our, our, system, our system governing boards weren't uh, wanting to um, uh, negotiate a fair contract with them. So for example, within the CSUs, um, faculty did end up also uh, uh, authorizing a strike vote. Um, they didn't go on a system-wide strike, um, but they did authorize one-day strikes. Um, so one was at my campus, Cal State Dominguez Hills, and then the other one was at CSU East, East Bay. Um, and because we did shut down our campuses, um, uh, the, uh, that board of trustees did back off and they were able to um, uh, negotiate a fair contract. And then the Occupy Movement happened. Yeah, sorry. Um, I guess technically 2011 was when, yeah, 2011 was when UC Occupies were then in conjunction with like the overall Occupy movement. 2008, 2009, it was already its own separate thing. But um, at the Occupies that were at the UC campuses themselves, that was when um, the campus environment became a lot more militarized and you saw UC police departments coming out with um, very heavy duty gear, rep repressing students. So there's a famous um, incident at UC Davis in which students were pepper sprayed during just a sit-in and by themselves there, there wasn't even that much of a big crowd or anything and similar situations would happen to students at um, UC San Diego. Cal State Fullerton, El Camino College, San Diego State, there's always been the case of police from the campus coming out and then initiating the violence against the students first rather than the other way around as the media tries to misportray it. So um, the tuition protests started up again around 2011 to 2012. There was also this campaign by Refund California and the Make Banks Pay Coalition but the, the fee hikes had, um, as Vanessa was pointing out, been scaled down to just slowly turning up the boiling water, so it was only five to nine, yeah. I'm sorry, just to add to that, between 2008 and 2012, because of that slow implementation, I think, like, for example, within the CSUs, our tuition had increased by over 300%. It was insane. <laughs> yeah. So um, students were, were still getting pepper sprayed and arrested and um, the fee hikes were, were on a smaller scale. So organizing by this point at the campus level got much more difficult as the fees were less um, ostentatiously, you know, you know, just, just engorged. Like, it, it's harder to connect with students and point out that 5% uh, semester fee increase is, is bad and you'd have to um, make, you'd have to talk to them about the history of these overall fee increases that have, you know, consistently been going up for them to realize that it's, it's part of this broader, um, you know, tuition hike. And at, you can go to, so, um, We've, we've had much smaller student groups organized as well um, at these uh, Cal State schools, um, Students for Quality Education. Then there's Reclaim the UCs. 
Academic Workers United for Democracy, which is affiliated with um, a union that represents our grad students, uh, United Auto Workers, Occupy Education Northern California, and um, the group that I mentioned um, uh, many slides ago, SKIOC, Southern California Education Organizing Coalition. So, um, uh, what this what this is a list of is basically all of the groups that were coming together to um, do these protests back in 2011-2012. So whole, all of these uh, coalitions started forming um, in Northern California. They they were centered around Occupy Education, and in Southern California, they were centered around Skia. Um So yeah, so basically we were uh, all protesting at our, at our Board of Governors um, meetings, uh, Board of Trustees, Board of Regents. We were getting arrested, we were getting pepper spray, we were just putting um, the pressure on, on those gears of power. Um, and then this kind of culminated um, in March 2012. Um, there was a march in March at our state capital. Um, uh, uh, there were 10,000 10, students that um, ended up converging in Sacramento um, and marching, and there was a 120 <coughs> student sit-in um, inside of the capitol, um, and 72 students ended up getting arrested. Um, during that same time, um, well, it was 2012, so we were having um, the elections in November. Um, and then uh, during that time, we had um, three uh, state propositions um, that were trying to, that were attempting to refund education. Um, the most progressive of these was called the millionaire's tax. Um, and that would have raised income taxes on anyone uh, making over uh, $1 million um, by uh, three, three to five percent. Um, and this would have done so um, indefinitely, so it would have been a permanent um, uh, tax on the rich, basically. On um, the three-fifths of that was earmarked for public education, um, and the rest for um, social services for kids, seniors, home safety, and infrastructure. Um, at the same time, um, our wonderful governor, <laughs> Jerry Brown, um, also put a, a similar state proposition um, on the ballot. Um, but that one only increased um, income tax on anyone making over 250000 for seven years. Um, and it also increased our sale tax by uh, a quarter uh, of a percent for four years. Um, and this also allocated um, money for K through 12 community colleges, um, higher education, um, and public safety. But the bad thing about it is that uh, all this money went into our general fund um, as opposed to strictly to, to education. Um, and what ended up happening is that um, our governor literally went to the home of the person who signed off on the millionaire's tax. His name is Josh Peshtalt, um, and he's the president of the California Federation of Teachers. Um, and he strong-armed him to basically kill the millionaire's tax. Um, and a lot of people were like super pissed off because it was a really grassroots kind of movement. Um, and they had make, been making their decisions like on a consensus basis, and this was basically a back row deal. Um, so we were just, uh, super pissed off. Um, so right now we do have Prop 30. Uh, our education has been refunded, but um, I think in 2017 um, that gets cut off. Um, so because I, so the point of going through all of this is the fact um, that because we were protesting, because we also coupled that. Um, with uh, what was happening um, during the elections, the proposition work, um, because we were able to pass some kind of proposition to refund education, um, what ended up happening was that the governor um, said, uh, basically um, asked our, our system governing boards to put a moratorium on fee increases. Um, so for, since 2012, we've had a, mor a moratorium on fee increases throughout all of our systems. Um, so that, that's supposed to last for four years. Um, that same year, um, we were also able to, the state legislature also passed a, a middle class scholarship that kind of eased um, um, some of the cost of education for uh, families making under $100,000. So this is the um, City College San Francisco accreditation issue that um, I mentioned earlier, but the ACCJC is um, supposedly um, uh, an agency that's um, authorized by the state of California to visit each campus and basically audit it so that the school is a verified um, institution. It's not just um, 
you know, publicly funded by the state of California and approved to operate by funding from the state of California, but it's approved and deemed um, operating up to standards. However, the thing is, the ACCJC itself is only authorized by the state of California. So when the City College San Francisco um, Save CCSF Coalition, which was a grassroots organization of concerned students and San Francisco community members, and their local faculty union, AFT 2121, did their research, they found out that the ACCJC was not an actual, um, um, what do you call it? Um, it? It was not an actual agency of the state of California itself. So the best analogy I can come up with is if um, your, your city or your state outsourced like a public service such as trash pickup or you know water and power to a private company. There's a lot of private funding that goes into the ACCJC, so from groups like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Lumina Foundation. And, and just to say in a quick sentence, the Bill and Gates Melinda Foundation is um, a pro-neoliberal um, education reform group. They endorse race to the top policies, standardized testing through Common Core, so things that test companies and online um, um, you know, class programs would benefit from because they would make a lot more money with, with the, these new interests. So the Department of Education from the federal government level actually took um, the Safe CCSF Coalition side and placed um, the ACCJC itself under sanctions, which is ironic because as part of its authorized power by the state of California, the ACCJC, when it does its auditing review of the school, is allowed to um, um, sanction um, a community college itself and say that they believe the school because it's violating these rules or it's not meeting certain standards like the test performance for instance is too low then they'll get warnings and, and so on. Oh yeah and um, this is a big issue to me personally because the ACCJC it audits community colleges so it wasn't just CCSF they visited my home school Los Angeles Valley College which is on that list there and they're visiting um, several dozens more throughout the state of California so even though the Department of Education is admitting that the ACCJC fucked up the ACCJC is still authorized by the state of California and is still out there you know in California wrecking havoc so I'm going to um, go through a few of these sites a little bit quickly because it is. So some, something else that's still um, happening, even though we have been able to fight back fee increases, um, is they're still finding ways to, to increase fees. So for example, um, they're, just, they're trying to pass it um, by creating a two-tier system within our community college system. So uh, instead of charging the normal fee during um, a certain uh, certain quarters or semesters, they want to push classes over to an extension program and charge uh, charge more for, for those units um, if it, uh, uh, during like winter or summer and the students who can afford it, you know, can go, can take those classes, but everyone else is kind of out of luck. Um, other things that are happening um, within the UC system, the, uh, the former secretary of, the Depart uh, of our Depar Department of Homeland Security, John Napolitano, has been appointed the UC president um, that has implications for um, undocumented students and also students who are um, active on campus. Um, uh, also, there's still, there's still um, uh, uh, boards that are un have been unwilling to negotiate for contracts with our staff and our faculty. So staff and faculties are still continuing to fight back on that. Um, another way that they're trying to implement fees, and now instead of doing system-wide um, fee increases, they're trying to do it campus by campus. So within the CSUs, for example, they have this thing called the student success fee, which sounds nice, right? But um, really what they're doing is they're, they're basically saying, well, if, if, you, if students want more class sections, then uh, you as a student, it's your responsibility to, it's your responsibility to pay the student success fee. Um, and again, that's being done campus by campus. Um, recently, it was, it's, it's been implemented at CSU Fullerton, Dominguez Hills, San Diego um, State, um, and, and Sonoma State. Um, Sonoma has been able to successfully um, uh, push back on that, so they were able to get that stopped. 
but um, if they're still pushing. Um, and something that has happened um, recently, our, our current state budget um, just uh, was released um, or approved, um, and our governor did approve additional monies um, for each of our systems. Uh, because students have also been fighting back against the student success fees, um, he forbade any more student success fees from being passed until at least 2016, um, and he increased financial aid for low-income students. Um, and to, to me, at least, like this, this, this current state budget, the state budget is an indication of all the organizing and pushback we've, we've um, been uh, working towards over the past few years. Um, but either way, um, you know, we have been able to win all of these short-term short fights, but they're not curing the problem, right? So these, these are just kind of like reforms um, that are being given to us, um, but they're, they're not really curing uh, the problem. For them. So to us, um, in order to actually um, address the fact that our systems continue to be defunded um, and that shared governance is still trying to be killed on our campuses, like for example, um, through the accreditation battle, oh yeah, so something um, that should be added to that is that the way that accreditation uh, works with a, in the process of being disaccredited, um, what that agency does is that it, um, it takes over the governing board of, of that school system and appoints a special trustee with exceptional powers that basically trumps um, any kind of democratic decision making that comes out of that board. Um, so that's their tactic um, for destroying democracy within the last bastion of democracy that we have within our school systems in California, which is a community college system. Um, yeah, so our solution to this is to unify. So the, all this privatization and neoliberal stuff we've talked about, it's a global issue because students in Canada, Mexico, Chile have been undergoing these same problems. But they, those countries have successfully enacted student unions by organizing together at the local level and continuing um, direct participatory democracy. So the, the kind of, um, you know, politicking shit that goes on in California where we rely on these elected politicians who are so disconnected from their constituents to represent us only to sell us out and throw us under the bus later on in their interest for re-election campaigns and for their actual corporate lobbyists doesn't work. So we, we have to... So um, I'm gonna run through the rest of the slides really quickly. Um, so uh, if you see anything that like I'm skipping through and you're like, oh crap, I really wanted to see that, you can just ask us during the Q&A. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're looking towards um, uh, uh, unions like ASE and looking towards them, uh, how they organize themselves. So um, during the process of building CASU, we've, uh, we've, we voted on organizing ourselves in a federated, um, non-hierarchical, decentralized um, structure um, via the process of direct democracy, um, with local groups holding regular GAs, um, and, and those local bases having the ultimate decision-making power. Um, and there's certain strategic um, advantages to doing that, which are those. <laughs> um, so uh, as we had mentioned before, our, uh, our current development is that we're a loose coalition of students. Um, this has proven a little bit difficult to um, sustain as a cohesive body because we are just a coalition. It's not like we're at a point yet where we're uh, like officially an org. Um, you know, there's a lot of turnover because people graduate, they're, they're working, um, or they're working on their own local, local campaigns, which kind of takes precedence over um, the, the larger um, goal of building this union or the structure. Um, and there's also been a, an influx of new students that um, because we're all so busy, it's been kind of difficult to bring them into the fold and help them understand what the project is. Um, we've mainly organized ourselves around statewide conferences. We hold two per year, one in the spring, one in the fall. Um, these are usually done, uh, structured as plenaries and, and breakouts. Um, the problem with doing, uh, with organizing ourselves like this so far is that it's, they haven't been very inclusive because not everyone can attend a statewide conference. Um, and people have to work or they just don't have the money to be able to afford to travel to wherever these are happening. 
Um, but they have been a good way to build solid relationships across the state. Um, so uh, these are just some of uh, the decisions that we've made at, at each of these conferences. So we've been trying really hard to be very um, democratic and work on a consensus basis. And I mean, it's taken us two years to basically get to the point where we've been able to say, okay, we want to structure ourselves in a federated, non hierarchical decentralized way and build those relationships. Um, so right now, we're at, well, that's the point that we're at. Um, also something important to know, out of the first two conferences, we came out with a set of mandate and principles. Um, I'll pass out, I brought a few copies of a flyer that um, we give when we, um, when we have actions, I could pass those out, those are on here. Um, later on you'll see a link to our website, those, these are also on there. So at this last, the last conference that we had, at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Um, it was the first time that we actually started to talk about what well, we should probably start planning actions together. Um, so this is, um, we, out of that conference, uh, students decided that they want to plan a week of action um, in the month of, Octo uh, of October based around these um, four demands. Um, and this is just our action planning timeline for that. Um, so something else that we've struggled with um, is again trying to build more a more of a solid way to connect with each other because right now it's just been like this coalition like we know each other but it's not like we're actually affiliates or we're actually chapters. Um, so the um, it, the, uh, the outreach and education committee um, recently met and decided that we should have a more formalized way to do that. Um, so they're going to start outreaching starting at the end of the summer at the beginning of fall. Uh, to the orgs that are, are already um, involved with CASU and like, actually asking them formally, like, do you want to be a chapter, do you want to be an affiliate, and what each of those things means. Um, um, also, we feel that it's important to inc uh, include um, interne intersectionality um, in a sense of col uh, collective liberation and the organizing that we do. And that, that, that it's important to understand that all of our struggles on campuses stem from the fact that um, our campuses and systems are being defunded and our democracy is being killed and how that how those two main two things are connected to every all the other stuff that's happening on our campus. Um, and so why it's important for us to just get along and understand each other's struggles. Um, so we also have uh, committees and working groups. Um, so we have a facilitation committee that plans conferences, a statewide coordinating committee that's starting to coordinate for statewide actions, outreach and education that's trying to support the locals and do trainings and hold events, um, a com communications and media team that takes care of um, setting up conference calls, um, uh, um, updating the website, a research working group that is going to be doing the research on the, the four demands for the action, and then also regional groups um, that coordinate um, regional meetings. Um, we actually have a statewide newsletter. It's kind of like in its infancy, but it's out there. Um, and we also hold the regional statewide conferences. Um, ultimately, our goal is to um, uh, find a way to again, take over of the democratic processes on our, on our campuses. So we do have to acknowledge for uh, student government um, and what that means, right? Do we want to take it over? Um, do we want to ignore it? Do we want to take it over and abolish it? Um, so it, it'll just depend on the context of each system and each campus. Um, so for example, within the CSUs and UCs, our student governments are their own nonprofit 501c3s. So they do have the legal ability to make their own decisions and not have to do what administrators say. Um, so if we are able to get in there, we can very easily just change our, our constitution and our bylaws and just say fuck you to, to admin. Um, but within the, the community college systems, they're not. They're, they, they're, they're tied to administrators. Um, so that, that has to be acknowledged and like do people want to pass some kind of uh, state law to help students um, gain their independence from administration? Do they just want to abolish those student government? So it's, it's just complicated, right? There's pros and cons depending on each.
Um, we also realized that um, the process of taking over democracy and ensure governance on our campuses, we can't do it alone. We have to do it by as students, as independent actors, um, able to make our own decisions. But we also have to understand that faculty need to get there on their own and that staff also need to empower themselves on their own. We can support them, but at the end of the day, anyone who organizes also understands that it's the, that the actors themselves within their own constituencies that need to empower themselves because we can't be organizing on other people's behalf. Um, so we need to all kind of be doing this at the same time while respecting each other's um, autonomy and ability to do it for ourselves. Um, and at the, uh, again, the long-term goal um, is to be able to refund our education systems for the long-term um, and, al and also to democratize our governing board. Um, and uh, to a few of us, um, and we feel that that would be the most possible by passing state propositions to do so. Um, because, um, for example, a uh, Senate and Assembly bill, it's still relying too much on legislature or like empowering like just one set of people, but state propositions are basically the power of the people. You actually have to get out there, talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, build a campaign, um, and actually empower the community. Um, so to, to a few of us, that's, that's the, the way to go. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'll make it quick. So uh, liberatory education would be um, a different philosophy instead of just, just coming to people and telling them what to think and telling them what's right or wrong. Instead, you, you have to try and work with um, empowering others so that eventually they're empowering themselves and are engaging in self-determination which means that you, you have to um, understand the full scope of oppression and privilege so that you realize the intersectionality of, of these different problems. So at CASU, um, yeah, um, we think um, free and accessible education is one way to approach this as well, and the most important way. We also believe in building alternatives to capitalism so that we can stop the privatization of natural and public resources um, we can criminalize um, public subsidy, subsidization of private projects, so tax money like from Prop 30 doesn't keep going into private prisons, um, promote and create worker co-op apprenticeships so that you know, there's no more um, you know, contract breaches and labor exploitation, socialize research funding and outcomes so that a lot of the R&D at your university or college is not instead for, you know, war and imperialism. But um, last but not least, ending corporate warfare, austerity policies, neoliberal shock doctrines that allow um, these, these for-profit bodies that are given um, carte blanche by the government to take away what tiny little democracy is left at your school's governing system and the political process. That's our contact info. Okay. <laughs>
the reason, one reason why it's really important for us to talk about this is to understand like what the limits of it are because we actually don't think that everyone should go to your student government. It's actually like very small, like few cases and under very particular conditions where it's actually strategic to do that. So we're talking about why we thought it was strategic for us and then also what the limits of it are um, and then what we intend to do with it. So um, the first question is like why, why did we run? Um, the, so you know, our end goal is to build federated student unions, much like folks here know about. Um, so the question is, how do we get from point A to point B? Where, like in the U.S., we have no history of those whatsoever. There's no infrastructure, and what infrastructure there is is actually, I would argue, some, perhaps controversially, but maybe not in this crowd, is the structure that does exist is actually an obstacle. There are a lot of nonprofits out there that are funded by wealthy people who have no interest in masses of students taking to the streets and like fucking up capitalism, those people, that funding is gonna dry up as soon as we become an actual threat. So we have no interest in actually working with nonprofits. It's actually a huge problem that happened in Ohio a few years ago. Um, there was a huge anti-labor push in the state of Ohio that sparked a lot of activism um, and then it all got funneled into nonprofits and completely withered away. So not just in that. Um, so how do we get to point A to point B without going to nonprofits because that won't work anyway. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is to destroy this thing where student governments legitimize and rubber stamp everything the administration does. So, for example, a few years ago, maybe, what was it, two years ago now? Yeah. Um, the administration was proposing a... No, that's, that's last year. The year before I had it. Yeah, yeah, so two, yeah, so, like, a little, yeah, a little over a year ago now. The administration was proposing a tuition hike, which they do every single year. Every, in Ohio, every institution, like public a university has its own board of trustees. And so our administration was proposing a tuition hike. The student government passed a resolution in support of the tuition hike. So, yeah, so like this is just like gives you some sense of like how lapdogish it really has been. Um, that exact, so the day of the board of trustees meeting where that was being voted on, the student union, which, we can get into like the sort of structure of what that means. Like, Tosca Student Union right now is not a federated student union. It is a like an individual sort of like club that is working toward organizing federated structures. Yeah. But what we did, yeah, and what we did um, was disrupt the board meeting and got four students arrested and blew up their shit all over the media across the state of Ohio. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they knew this was coming. We've been threatening it and whatnot. And so, actually, for the first time in like maybe 20 years. The uh, tuition hike we went through that year was less than the maximum amount allowed under the state law. So it had some small impact. Even instead of 2%, it was 1.6%. But um, so the state actually put a cap at 2%, which is, you know, nice. um, The other thing that's really strategic about the your student government is it gives you, sometimes, depending where you are, money and resources. So like the student government is paying for us to be here right now. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> So, uh, the, so to talk about a little bit like why it was strategic for us to run and how exactly we were able to take over student government. Because if you ever tried to do it, you would know it's actually very hard, very entrenched. Um, they have a lot of resources. For example, we have like an alumni group <laughs> that is like people who are in the student government for like past several decades who make sure that like there's no significant overturn. Uh, it's kind of insane, but. Um, so one thing we did is try for several years the best we could to undermine the credibility of the existing student government. They did a lot of it on their own. <laughs> uh, so last year we had this really terrible misogynist president who, interestingly enough, is on the, like the student government is like science, like this is what an Ohio University feminist looks like, his face is on it, along with a bunch of other people. And then that fall, there was like this big scandal because he like tweeted about That's like walk shaming. of shame, like slut shaming, you know, like, these girls walking home and they like pinky dresses, whatever. So he's a terrible human being. Um, and then he got. Uh, he's interested for a drunken squirrely at a football game. Football game. <laughs> 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 Made the bus late going back home to go to jail. Wow. So there was a little, they did a little bit of their own. But well before that ever happened, we'd actually been working to undermine the credibility of the student government just by pointing out how ridiculous it was. By like, you know, for example, when the student government passed a resolution in support of a tuition hike, like we disrupted the board meeting and got like the students were arrested. So it's like demonstrating these schools are like not really working toward students' best interests. 
Um, although, I will say, don't discard everyone who's interested in government because there are a lot of good people in there. It's just like not really clear to them how to do the things they want to do. And it, it, you know, the most obvious answer is like work within the structure that exists. You realize that, that doesn't work. Um, so, um, so at the same time, we're sort of like working to point out every every single time they did anything ridiculous, we would like write a letter to the editor of the like student newspapers, so or like constantly trying to blow up like, you know, look at these ridiculous things they're doing. Um, so people completely kind of like lose faith in the student government. Meanwhile, we're building up the credibility of the student union by engaging in direct actions and like blocking the student trustees bus, like the, or the, board. the board of trustees bus. Um, we have student trustees, it's a different story. They don't want to have voting rights, it's very strange. Um, they, uh, and so by sort of like being the most vocal and the most combative student organization that's fighting for students' interests, people already knew what the student union was, they sort of knew what it was all about, and a lot of people were sort of like, Freaked out by it because they're like, you all are getting like arrested, and you're like talking about capitalism. And, um, but but they, you know, we had like their interest, um, and so when we ran on the restart ticket to restart the student government, um, they sort of we like said it was like the student unions campaign to restart student government. They like knew what they were all about. Um, also, we had the like infrastructure to organize a campaign in place because we already had an organization. Um, part of the uh, way we built the organization up to the point where we were before we started the campaign was by, you know, uh, I think Portland maybe talked about this a little bit. You know, there are already all these like different campaigns and like student activist groups on campus, and so our sort of strategy was to bring them together on a sort of umbrella organization of the student union to say like, look, divided, we're really not going to win any of these campaigns because there's sort of like small fragmented groups that are asking people for things that they have no interest in giving you. But if we like. You know, sort of collectivize. Um, actually, kind of uh, when lately, recently, which we'll talk about later. Um, another thing that we had going for us is that um, we like are smarter than the people that are in student government. <laughs> and by which I mean, like, not more intelligent, but actually like study politics, like, and not in the sense we go to class, but that we like also, come to places like this and we actually engage in a broader student movement. And, we have like longevity and people who are really dedicated to the cause, like building a student movement, whereas they were like, most of the people, at, let's say at least the leaders of the student government previously, mostly are only interested in their own like resumes, they have no real interest in building a movement, anything like that. So, um, the fact that we actually like, think about strategies and tactics and things like that is like a huge advance for people who are like simply trying to like shake hands with administrators. Um, so, so that's, a little bit about like how we won. Obviously, we don't have like a ton of time, but if you want to like know in depth sort of like the campaign strategy, things like that, talk to us. Like we'll definitely talk about that through. Um, so the limits. This is really an important part. Uh, what do we think the limits of thinking of the student government are? There are a lot of them. You know, obviously, whenever like there's some advantages, but there are serious limits. Um, first and foremost, one of the biggest problems with student governments is it creates the illusion of power. Like, you know, you have this formalized thing that can pass resolutions all day. I mean, we could now, we can control the student government, like, we can pass resolutions and make statements that are super radical, doesn't matter. They have no weight behind them whatsoever. So, like, we can go in, you know, day one and pass resolutions on, like, tuition freeze, BDS, all the rest. None of it matters. We have nothing to back it up. Um, and so, we want people to understand that, like, yeah, thank you for voting for us, but we actually need you to also come and be a part of it and actually come and organize and come to demonstrations and things like that. Um, so there's actual, like, it, it, you know, it can be a little bit confusing when on the one hand we're saying, like, vote for us into office, um, but also, like, don't stop there. That's actually, you know, kind of minimal. Um, Another serious limit is that we now have to sort of like carry out bureaucratic management duties that we didn't have to do before. Um, and there are certain things, you know, and like technically we could just drop them and say like, okay, we're not doing those things anymore, but it would piss off a lot of students and we would lose our ability with students, which is exactly what we don't want to do. Because ultimately a lot of student governments today like aren't really political, they're really programming bodies, they sort of like put on nice little like events, like whole cool things, whatever, which are all very well and good not the role of student government. Um, and so we need to like carry a lot of the stuff that you know we have like really no interest in doing. And like yeah we get to go into these committee meetings and be like 
don't don't raise tuition, but again, it doesn't matter. Um, another thing is like it may not actually be strategic for like Megan will talk a little bit like why like the real thing about like how we think that taking up the student government actually is going to help us in building a federated student union. Um, but one of like you know a big limit is that it like, may not always be strategic for us to stay there. Um, like we did it this year, so basically our philosophy on it is like we should always assume that it's not strategic for us to take our student government and have to convince ourselves that it will be um, continue to be strategic to stay there. Like if at any point it's not, at any point from the dead end, we should recognize that and like peace out. Um, so that's really important, like component of all of this. Um, which is, the, the, I guess, sort of the danger there, though, is that people, you know, organizations tend to be self, uh, like, caring, or tend to be oriented towards self-preservation, and so if we um, sort of start to imagine and behave as if we were just the student government and actually not an organization that is trying to, like, build something else, then um, then that can sort of, like, you know, what, what, what we did have is, like, a student union as an independent organization, again, not be holding any sort of, like, bureaucratic bullshit within the university because we didn't exist the university, um, we now, like, you know, uh, we, we, if a bunch of, we get a bunch of students arrested now, they can just be like, okay, well, now you don't have funding to go to Montreal. So, um, there are, are those problems. <coughs> we have, you know, rules we have to follow now, we have to follow before. Yeah, so, like, revisiting, like, the main two things that we're walking into with this existing governance structure is, you know, the, the role of, like, rubber stamping, being kind of, like, student face of the administration, and then uh, like currently student senate at OU is like a programming body. So the first easy, easiest thing is to kind of like change the tone and no longer be a rubber stamp, right? So like now I'm the one in those meetings. <laughs> um, and I don't really decide how I feel about um, their corporate interests. So like that's like an easy thing, but again, like uh, in the end, mostly symbolic. Uh, and then the programming body is, is a bit different. Because like, we believe that student senate and student government should not be a programming body, um, it should be a political body. So how do we transition to that like, smoothly without um, upsetting a lot of students that depend on that funding for their programs? And kind of like basic answer um, uh, is like reconsidering cultural events and like who is going to be organizing them. So instead of student government putting on cultural events or on, um, like organizing speakers, whatever, uh, like the groups where those interests lie the most, like the Black Student Union, the Teen Student Union, hold those cultural events and give the direct money directly to them. Um, and then like bigger issues like race and gender, of course, student government has a huge role in that, but um, only for waging collective power in those interests um, instead of, like, again, like cultural events. Um, so those are the first two things, right? We're like, okay. So how are we going to create a federation through student government? Um, basically, like Senate is organized uh, with like elected senators and different academic departments. Um, so our strategy is to take those academic senators and instead of being representative, turning them into organizers. Um, so they are going into their academic colleges uh, and organizing student associations within those like, shared departments' interests. Um, and then, uh, really, once we have like three, five people within our like core student government group, um, you know, that, that student association begins to form and thrive. Um, and I mean, this is exactly what we were doing as a student union. But now um, we have no other kind of like symbolic uh, organizations that people get confused by, you know, like. <laughs> thinking that someone is, is actually going to be representing them. Um, now we are taking away that uh, indirect line and um, putting like, democracy there again. Um, and we do this through campaigns. Like how do you organize people around anything? Through a campaign. So those campaigns are like directly uh, uh, related to like those students' daily lives. So it's, it's again, like the core group, of course, like interested in um, larger aspects of tuition, etc. Uh, but it's, we found like a lot of success in engaging students um, directly within 
the things that I describe don't work for you, you gotta like bag them quick and do some nails. Because <laughs> like we have had like tons of, of failures and it's I think like as the like US student movement um, grows, we're gonna see that like it's very dependent on where you are and like what day it is. Um, and then also like what's happening around the world. Um, I think, I mean, like, that was a big part of Austin Pie, right? Like, uh, a lot of people got sick of it because of the, just, like, the process that they were using, right? And they, and they left, so it wasn't like, yeah, I guess, like, <laughs> Yeah, like, we all kind of got sick of it, right? Um, so, uh, finally, um, you know, because, like, this is a panel on, like, you know, local, federal, like, national law, whatever, like, how do we work all together, like, the US um, I kind of want to like demystify this thing that like, it's like Athens, Ohio is a really small role. It's like the, uh, the the poorest county in Ohio. Like we don't get um, much attention from the state house, right? In a certain sense. So, uh, but but I actually like love that, and um, I think it's like very important that uh, we realize like how strong of a commitment and investment. Forming a student union anywhere is. So, um, like, to focus a lot of attention on your one campus instead of, uh, you know, like, so we've always had a lot of people, like, saying, like, you gotta go to the Capitol, right? You gotta go to the State House um, to do these rallies because your rallies aren't doing anything in small town America. Um, that's just, like, frankly not true. And if we are able to, like, organize and be really strong where we are, that can, um, I mean, if one thinks in my head, like, that's a su successful model for replication, right? And, like, that's what we're here to do now. Um, and, and, like, we can and figure, figure things out quickly, right? Like, we're not waiting for anything big to happen at a state or national level. Like, we're making things happen in our front yard. Um, yeah. So, like, building local and, and generalizing later um, seems to be working really well. Um, yeah. I'm just gonna like say again how bad nonprofits are. Um, <laughs> I've had a lot of like personal horrible experience like over my uh, time in, in, in like grassroots campaigning and political movement. I mean, really like uh, in, in recent times even. Um, really, just because of our like maintaining political independence, um, financial independence is a complete precondition to any sort of political independence. So. I mean, Tyler already said that, so I'll move on, but, um, like, again, like, be aware of, like, statewide works, um, like, what they have to offer always seems, like, really great, uh, but we proved over this campaign, like, that we don't, we do don't need that, and a lot of, like, the success or, like, instant kind of uh, gifts or whatever, like, that that provides, or, like, maybe even, like, a little bit of, like, number growth doesn't last. Um, and it, like, those organizations are growing for the wrong reasons um, and uh, are, are not viable in the end, so. And to be clear about the nonprofit thing, we don't actually, when we say nonprofit, we don't mean like nonprofit, like in terms of the legal, um, like existence of a 501c, for example. What I mean is like, really, regardless of its sort of legal status, more like, where does the money actually come from? If the money is coming from these like giant like liberal progressives that are really just gonna like come 2016 say like you need to go out and like fucking do voter rights for Hillary, then like <laughs> no thank you, we're not going to do that. So it's really about like where the money comes from, not so much like the legal, you know, like because like a final one so you can probably do like really great things if its money is not coming from like rich people who want you to vote for Hillary. So, <laughs> so I think that's it, and we should do Yeah, that. I think we have like, a lot more to say, so please like, come talk to us. It's been a really great year, so I love to <laughs>
So what was the question? Like how is how is the student union representative different and similar to like a traditional political representative like your congressperson? Ah uh, yeah. So the idea is that once um, once we actually have the capacity to start building infrastructure within an individual academic department or college, then that senator who like, represents those students should be directly accountable to them and to that association. And so they're actually not voting for themselves. They're voting like literally what that association decides on. And they're able to like, build in ways for them to be accountable. So things like immediate recall and things like that, or like just an agreement that if like someone votes in a way that is not in line with their student association, then the rest of the student senate can just remove them from their seat. So um, they, the idea is to like make them directly accountable to what they're trying to organize. Yeah, I know it's a very important for all of you, I guess, and I think the difference is very striking to me you know, in terms of the level of struggle in the state in Canada. And I went to I've been to two kind of universities, but in most places, you know, student government is not only not doing anything, they're actually actually preventing students from doing it. You know, they're basically on the way between students and administration, and it's such a bureaucracy that actually, you know, they always complain about how apathetic students are, but they're actually generating athletes. <laughs> And uh, at our university, it's um, general managers, and that's actually running, basically deciding everything on behalf of the executive. Not officially, but basically, like, she's worked here for 40, 40 years, 45 years, so she you know, she acts as she knows everything. Yeah, and the um, <laughs> thing is that the president uh, of the USSU sits on the board of governors, which is like, similar to the board of so it's basically to be tied to the Bible of the Board of Governors, so he can criticize, he can't criticize anything. Um, so, and finally, um, I think the support one, uh, I think uh, we also have a similar clause in our statement that says that UMS is people of the university, like it, 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 their mission is to serve the people of the and, um, and also, like in reality, it's, it's, that's not the case, what's going on in reality, but it's actually can point to the contradiction. And so have conversation in organized around it as well. And have point out how it's not people in the university, but it should be in the real sense. So I think it's uh, an interesting Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I
infrastructure at hand. Because once upon a time, for instance, my community college system had a bus pass where people didn't need to pay for the bus, and it got worse, and they took that away. And I'm pretty sure um, you can just like tr trace these connections.
Portland Student Union meeting yeah. to organize our organizational charter. <laughs> organization. Like, right. Humor can do so much to like get a radical political message to people. Uh, Than like the style, so there's like the for like I mean, okay, like this is not going to be shocking to anyone, but like there's a general like anti Greek life thing in the U.S. Probably valid, but like we have like a really solid member who is a vice president of this fraternity, and this is not like like this is a very broy fraternity, like it's not this is like your stereotypical fraternity. But he's also like a leftist. He's also like bringing those like people from that sort of like community who have these ideas but are sort of like secluded from the student union because of like honestly nothing more than stylistic issues like um she's really concerned about like the substance of what people like people's politics rather than you know like their like click or whatever it is like, also one thing that we did with um when we organized the walkout we used this text loop where like by joining the text loop you know you pledge to walk out look for ways to like gamify any tactic you might be engaging in like Especially because we're on this huge urban commuter campus, it's like literally 50 acres. Um, anything you can do to like decentralize stuff and make it easy for other people to just sort of self-select into kind of helping out and getting their friends involved, like on a really low capacity level. Um, and you know, like because when you join the text loop, you get a little message back saying, "Oh, you know, 499 people have already joined. We only need one more. Sign that guy who's on the bus next to you up, and we're good." Um, like any, anything that makes it a little like competitive, I think, kind of strips away some of the dullness, and again, will just make it more fun, more accessible, and people won't initially be like, "Oh, politics again." Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I think that's like one big advantage that we have on that, um, especially like if you're going to be running a student government, like like I was. Like uh, at first, I was um, like really critiqued my lack of like um, politician um, veneer, you know, like this is what I wore to debate, right? And I got like a lot of uh, flack for it and critique, but like as time went on and like the contrast like sort of grew and people like saw me as a real person mm -hmm. and you know, um, like my, my kind of like main uh, opponent more is like, you know, uh, George Bush type, like, <laughs> <laughs> like literally it's crazy, it's uncanny. <laughs> Like being like as real and genuine as possible, and talking to people about uh, like you know the struggle that we're in, like as they're your friend, like you know to the strangers, to, to the people like on on, on press conferences, you know like uh, I, I have a hard time sometimes. I get like really wrapped up in rhetoric, you know, and like theory, and uh, I really had to work hard to like get get, get past that like on, on the public level, you know. And so it's like that combination um, of being like accessible and. Patient, right? Because like we were not born uh, like radical revolutionaries, you know. <laughs> you have to undo, you know, almost a decade or two of, of like, you know, yeah, socialization, indoctrination, <laughs> media propaganda. Well, I have two quick comments. First, on intersectionality, our 
issues when they're only you know about 500 of them at you know 10,000 students in school, and we got 10 percent of the total student population signed this petition, the vast majority of non-international students, which made a huge impact. And then we have a ton of allies and friends um, in the Iranian community, the Pakistani community uh, that we didn't have before, um, and it's because you know, because we exactly what you guys have said, taking their issues into consideration and working with them, not telling people what to do. We're also involved with a group that we recently launched called We Are Oshawa. And to speak to the humor aspect, we did a minimum wage monopoly. So we worked on the minimum wage campaign in Ontario uh, for the past year. And we had someone dressed up as our, uh, I just recently resigned from our right wing party in Ontario, Tim Hudak, you know, the jail guard who would uh, take people off to jail because they couldn't pay the rent, right? And we did it in front of Jim Clarity's uh, partners, uh, constituency officers at the local or, uh, or MPP uh, in our, in our so the humor really works. Now the question on the nonprofit, though, we're in this weird stage where we do really cool stuff. We're doing child care campaigns. We did a wage campaign. You know, Canada published to save uh, more than mail delivery. So there's like a lot of really awesome stuff we're doing, but we're in this weird stage. We're not self-sufficient yet for our funding, and we are having to rely on you know some of these faceless, you know, across the country NGOs that you know are investing we don't have money, right? Um, and so how, do you have any tips on how we become self-sustaining, you know, wean ourselves away from that so we do have that political dependence because of our financial dependence? How many people are in your nonprofit? Well, we have an executive board and then we have general memberships. We're, we're, our general membership is the highest number of authority in our nonprofit and we're really, really, really pushed for that. So our membership now and our list is anywhere between, you know, we have 30 or 50 people to our general meetings to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and all the executives are subject to recall. Um, so it's, we're just flat as we possibly can in a non-profit legal setting, yeah. but yeah. we're trying to raise money separate from the NGO the industrial complex. So it's <laughs> Do people pay dues? So it's free membership, but we ask people to give what they can. So we're also affiliated with local labor, so we're, you know, we're trying to approach unions and different yeah. locals to give monthly donations out of their, from the local. Um, that's something we're doing in the next month or two. Um, but we also would like that people have a financial stake, even though I'm you know, poor, I'm going to exclude myself and even a parent, um, so I can like you, sister. Um, but I want to give what I can too, right? I know it's important for people to contribute what they can, when they can. So I don't, I don't know if I've answered my own question, but I want to know if you have any, um, like preamble, but if you guys have any advice on how to do like, you know, micro donations or people, you know, grassroots fundraising so we can do ourselves. Yeah, we really believe in I mean, especially like, like in, I know I'm an artist, and like we, like so I think like for any like radical person or group, like we need to like get out of like capitalist means of supporting uh, ourselves, right? So like we need to become like self-funded and publicly funded. Do you want to add to that? Well, I mean, I think you're on the right track of being like grassroots fund. Like that's the most important thing. I think we find out locally how to do it, but. Like, I mean, there are like silly things, like seriously, like Etsy shops and shit like that. Like people like make crafts, like make just like cool buttons or like shirts or, or whatever. Just like little things that like your group can do for itself. Yeah. Um, like like um like crowdfunding or whatever it's called, like like that. Like uh, when I was arrested for that action, the next day, like all of my court fees and the three other women that were arrested were paid by like you know pretty like. You know, like kind of small donations, like you know, like five to a hundred dollars, uh, like goes goes really far. Um, and then, like also, our campaign was mostly funded um, by ourselves, like out of pocket, and um, like then, but, like really, the majority of the, like small donations from like those like donation sites. I can maybe give you something approaching an answer that'll be kind of anecdotal and a little situational. So again, it's like. Whatever you're doing should be totally context driven and it's not drop it fast, like you said. Um, but so what what we did is at Portland State, again, almost every student has a job, if not two, um, a child, if not three or four. And so we were really looking for a way to make organizing <laughs> more accessible. Um, and what what that meant for people was money. Um, so we have been working, back in September, we approached kind of the faculty unions and SEIU, the union that represents campus workers, and made this pitch where they would be funding a number of stipended organizing fellows um, through this thing called Together for PSU, which is a coalition of 
students, faculty, adjunct faculty, and um, service workers. And so by February, we had this program up and running. Um, Nina and myself were actually paid to organize since February, which was really cool. I got to quit my job and have to pay. Um, but so now that we, now that their investment paid off so significantly, um, there are members within the faculty union who are pushing to quintuple the number of positions offered and also pony up money for like training over the summer and like really be able to build a resilient structure for organizing students and faculty together so that next time the administration tries to get their contract, we have this whole system in place and we don't have to start from square, square one all over again. So I mean, labor unions definitely have a lot more money than they like to pretend. <laughs> Figure out when their budget meetings are, bring a proposal that's watertight, ready to get grilled because they don't like to part with that money easily and they're really gonna give it to you. Um, so you know, you know your shit, I guess, before you go to that room, it's kinda scary at first. Um, but yeah, if, if you're persistent, I'll, I'll look it up. Um, I'd like to say something, I guess, just because I'm from Quebec, so there's so many Americans in the room that I feel you can benefit from some of the policy that's been implemented here. We have legally accredited student unions here, which, so union unions aren't as much of an issue, so um, if you can push for that kind of state policy change, it could really benefit you. Now, whether the unions we create with these huge cash coffers are actually representative, that's a whole different story. <laughs> so how about I not touch that one? But like in terms of financing, um, having these bodies that have huge cash coffers allow us to create like other independent organizations. And you know, we get to prop up kind of more community representative organizations through fee levies and stuff. So what we do is with fee levies is a few cents per credit allows you to fund whatever, you know, a food justice campaign, a divestment campaign, or whatever. So um, appealing to your fellow students with fee levy, um, fee levy funding of profit, uh, of projects could be an easy way to go. So yeah, maybe talk to the Quebec law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What not? Why not? Just simply frugality. Like it sounds really obvious, but like yeah. find the cheapest fucking way to do everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So uh, I think this is kind of the, the place to talk about how 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 the single forward. Obviously, that's the discussion, right? Um, and I think the California example eliminated a lot of what things can start to look like on a large scale. But as you pointed out, some of you know some of the challenges with like having and coming to depend on physical conferences to make larger scale uh, decisions is like is incredibly you know uh, it, it's not inclusive and it's, and it's something you can only do frequently. Um, and, and at the same time, you're trying to represent like multiple organizations on multiple scales. So you've got like check, like large group, regional groups that have like sub chapters and that sort of thing, and, that, and that's like really challenging to do well representatively or, or you know, uh, just not easily. Um, and so I think so. So one of the, one of my main interests um, and, and the project that some colleagues and I are working on that I really want to try to talk talk out with as many people can to come talk to me is building uh, building a web infrastructure uh, to basically uh, put, put something in place that can allow this decentralized decision making that can flow upwards. Um, that can basically, I mean, everyone saw that the, uh, the graph they had of the California Student Union. Uh, it's the snowflake. We're all really familiar with the snowflake. The problem is that once you make the coalition, that snowflake tends to like melt and you, once you, once you like do your action or whatever, you know, a phone call stops and everyone forgets and they go back to their regionalized thing. There's nothing, there's nothing to hold these decisions in place. There's nothing to hold these groups together. Um, and so if, if we can move forward to sort of building something with that kind of like lateral integration, I don't want this to sound like a business meeting or whatever, but with lateral integration, <laughs> um, uh, I think that we can start like just literally building power uh, in, in that sense. And, and you know, if, if, I, if I go to some state and I'm part of an organization 
Uh, I want to be able to know all the other organizations in that state or in my region or my country that are doing the same things. We should be able to agree on the same principles and move forward. Like if there's if there's 500 people in this country that all agree and have organizations that are trying to do the same thing and they don't know shit about each other and they can all be one giant power piece, uh, it's a crime that they're not. And so what kind of structure can build that? Um, and that's that's the kind of the thing that I think is really important to talk about. Uh, and that's why I think it's really important that we don't make too many compromises or sacrifices on the direct and participatory, participatory democracy because that might be like the common downfall that a lot of nonprofits and a lot of groups take where they want a shortcut to that hive mind status where everyone's on the same page. But the cost would be that they're calling all the shots at the meetings, they're setting the direction for a lot of the the discussions and and they are telling people what to think and trying to like you know pull, you know jumpstart that that sort of um, you know unity. But if, if people involved are not you know um, of their own volition and free will coming to those terms and putting the knowledge in their hands and just that, then it's not necessarily entirely democratic. So maybe Vanessa can answer. Yes, I can ask you that. That's what we're trying to figure out in California as well. That's why we're at a point where the Outreach and Education Committee has come up with definitions for what a chapter is versus what an affiliate is and what the roles of each of those entities are. So for us, a chapter would be an entity that's on a campus trying to organize locally, trying to build that structure of direct democracy. Um, trying to make sure that any coalition that is built is formalized, but at the same time does respect the autonomy of each individual player on that campus, um, versus affiliates who are who are student organizations who are already doing amazing work, amazing organizing on campuses um, or across the state, but they want to affiliate to that network of decision making, um, but they don't necessarily want to do the work of building the structure and educating and training. So that's where we're at. I think we have time for maybe one or two more. But um, we want to make sure people have, if we're like 1225, we want to make sure people have time to get lunch before the next round of sessions. But we're thinking maybe, if, it sounds like a lot of people want to keep talking about this. So maybe we can try to cluster up it during the dinner hour. Yeah. Um, so folks, if you want to get in the cafeteria, do you want to continue this conversation?
Board of, Reg Board of Trustees and Board of Regents members, when they vote on something, propose um, their vote matters, and faculty and students are not part of these boards, so they don't have votes, period. They're a symbolic figurehead um, trust, uh, student trustees on these boards, but it's like one student trustee and the nine you know, administrators that is representationally like a disproportionate ratio. Are you going to like your body and what is in the message of the of these students? Because a lot of these boards are reading that they're supposed to be going to do things that are best for the university. And so often, tuition increase is about ensuring that there's a budget to continue the work that the university is doing. And so often, even students get sort of thrown into the student representatives, the we have a fair number, are thrown into the sort of rhetoric of the best interest of the university is the budget and not the education of the students, which is great. So thank you for redefining that too. Right? Uh, yes. That is, <laughs> it's been like a really, I think, sort of like significant thing that we've been up against. So I talked about like how the student government like passed a resolution in support of a tuition hike. That was like the exact argumentation. It was like, oh, well, this is what's best for the institution. I mean, you know, we're all good bobcats, so like, we'll do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But on the point of like administrators, I think that it's important to realize like there are some people who as, as individuals will do things to help you, but structurally they their hands are sort of tied. Like um, like we have like an administrator who or in a name who like feeds us money secretly. Um, <laughs> this is like up, like top echelon type folk. Um, can't get into it. And yeah, I mean, like, the influence like that. And so it's like, not like that person should be not like to that person an enemy. But if that person ever ends up like, we should recognize that like our interests and their interests might end up like coming into a class. So we don't want to like depend on that because like we will fight them. It, it, be. It, it, you heard a lot like in our talk that like we are building, there's a lot of like building outside of the existing structures and then getting so powerful that those become illegitimate and fade away. Like, uh, like we cannot like, not work within these existing systems, you know. So, like, no matter like, <laughs> like the individuals that like are are, are very like, kind. Like, it, it's not about the individuals, right? It's about like the positions of power that they hold yeah. that they are never going to let go of. And if that person, like that person, does, another person's going to have that seat. Mm -hmm. So, like, that. I mean, that's how I stand. Okay. Very last. Question. Yeah. I just wanted to go off that. Um, like at OU, we were Nostalgia for it, but um, 
like they can't give it to us anyway. Um, and even if they could, even if they could, um, that's not exactly what we really want anyway. So. Thank you so much for. Sometimes over the course of next week, all the videos of the conference are also going to be available. Yeah. Yeah.
uh, student union that uh, we've been trying to build power in a couple different ways. Right now we're starting with sort of how to, unlike people would be saying, expand beyond sort of our initial core of organizers um, and deal with sort of issues like drifting towards um, more like an anarchist affinity group or trying to expand to like a full on um, mass organization and how to play that without like,
is our background. So this is from where we talk. Uh, and so uh, in Quebec, uh, right now, the student unions are uh, structured in such a way that, for example, on the campus, uh, all the students are member are mandate, uh, have a mandatory membership to the student union, and the, the administration uh, take, take fees, take membership fees for the for the, from the students and gives it to the student union uh, in what we call sujet, uh, which is like a, a, this is like the education structure in Canada. The, the, one is in Quebec. Uh, if you look just after the uh, secondary school uh, and before bachelor's degree, uh, there is something that we call CJS. So it's like in between high school and, and university. Uh, and CJS makes like a preparatory university classes and technical school. So in CJS, there is only one student union per campus. Campuses are from like a thousand to six thousand students approximately, and in universities, uh, uh, student unions uh, are have different structures. Sometimes it's departmental student unions. So, for example, the geography uh, department has one student union. Sometimes it's faculty. Uh, uh, for example, the social science faculty. So it, it includes all the departments in social science, and there's one student union for this. And sometimes it's like campus-wide student unions. Uh, campus-wide student unions, when it's a small university campus, sometimes have a, a general assembly. But when it's a large campus, for example, at the University of Montreal, which is like 45,000 members, it's, uh, the, the campus-wide student union is a federation of departmental student unions. Um, the, this was not always like that. Uh, and it's important to keep that in mind. Um, back in 1960, back, back in the 60s, uh, student unions in Quebec didn't exist really. We were we had something uh, more closely related to uh, student governments or student associations in the sense of uh, uh, like a community of interest uh, that were closely tied with the uh, 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 or university administration. Um, these student association or uh, uh, government were dissolved after the 1968 uh, student strike. Uh, this strike uh, was like uh, an echo from the May 68 uh, in France. Uh, it was more a spontaneous strike uh, based on campus occupation, so uh, students were like uh, taking out their campuses, and it was like the first year CJS were created. Uh, so, uh, anyway, it was uh, uh, Ali College yeah. Anyway, uh, then the, the students at that time criticized the way some uh, governments were structured and dissolved them uh, in most cases. Uh, and during the 70s, uh, students tried to organize themselves in something more like the student unions we know now. But at the time, there was no legal recognition of those student unions, and uh, administrations were fighting those student unions. Uh, they were based on general assemblies, but they didn't have a, a mandatory membership or mandatory uh, fee. Uh, so they were funding themselves with like a voluntary, uh, uh, voluntary views. The, they still managed to do a uh, general strike in uh, 1974 and another one in 1978. So even though they were not as structured as they, as they are now, but they managed to do like big uh, uh, movements and they won some big fights. It's in the, those years that we won the tuition creeds that makes the tuition fees so low in Quebec right now. And it's in those years that we want uh, the bursary uh, and uh, the bursary program to help like poor families to get to um, By the beginning of the 80s, uh, the, 
the, like the social democrat government that came in power decided to uh, legislate uh, the student unions to formalize them. So they, they passed a law to recognize legally the student unions uh, to, uh, to give them the power to uh, have a mandatory use. Um, and it's important to understand that at that point, many student unions had won the right to collect mandatory dues uh, by building power against their uh, local administration. So, so for example, on a, a specific campus, uh, after 10 years of uh, struggles, they managed to force the administration to, uh, to give them money. Uh, and even though the government had, had not legislated that before. Uh, and at that time, in 1982, uh, the left-wing student union were fighting against the law that the government uh, passed because they didn't want their uh, their capacity to uh, uh, build uh, power against administration to be uh, restricted by a provincial law. Uh, well, they lost that fight. So, um, uh, everybody knows that, especially in North America, the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, was characterized by a, a neoliberal uh, agenda and uh, the rise of the right wing uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, the combative left wing uh, unions had a hard time at this point. And what people fear uh, about the law of 1982 uh, became partly uh, true when the right wing uh, students or more uh, conservative. Like when your principal, uh, when your main activity is doing lobby with like uh, uh, reformists, yeah, we can say that. Yeah. So reformists took power and many student unions controlled the, the funding. The, the, the combative uh, province wide student union that was my next died in the beginning of the 90s, and the second, the third, which are like the right wing student unions in Quebec were born in the beginning of the 90s. Quebec was born on the bus. Uh, their slogan was, uh, never again the strike. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I maybe, uh, I, I talked about local student unions, or for example, departmental student unions, or campus-wide student unions. Uh, but we also have uh, province-wide uh, student unions. But they are no, they, they are federations of student unions because, well, at the province-wide level, it's hard to do a general assembly. Um, so uh, right now we have ASSE, or you may have heard it by the name of CLASS, which was the temporary coalition. Uh, during the strike, and there is Pekin uh, uh, which still exists right now. Um, uh, when we talk of direct democracy in these student unions, uh, we talk about the General Assembly being the supreme uh, ruling body of the, the organization. Um, and we talk about uh, elected uh, executive councils that are always uh, directly uh, accountable to the General Assembly. Uh, they have very little uh, margin <coughs> to, uh, to operate outside of what the General Assembly wants. They can be uh, uh, revoked. Yeah. Their mandate can be revoked uh, any time, usually. And, uh, when, uh, when I talk about ASSE especially, the ASSE Congress, so when the, the federation meets with the delegates of each student union, uh, these, those delegates don't have, uh, cannot go far away from the mandates that are voted in General Assembly. So ideally what happens is that they need a, a direct mandate from the General Assembly on specific motions to vote. If they don't have it, they, they usually abstain. So, yeah, so, so uh, one thing about the General Assembly, and Rosia can speak about this, is that uh, the General Assemblies uh, that we have uh, in our 
student money are not like the ones that you may have seen in Occupy uh, the Occupy movement uh, or other kind of more informal general assemblies. Uh, in Quebec, there are very, uh, very strict uh, procedural codes to uh, maintain order in the assembly. Uh, it's kind of a simplified and more democratic uh, uh, code than like the rubber of order, but it still goes with like a, principal motion and uh, amendments and that kind of stuff. Um, we, the, 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 the code is, uh, is strictly applied, but it, it, it is simple to uh, prevent uh, like the, the, the animation of the assembly to use an arbitrary notion of what can be done and what can't be done. So uh, it, it's made in such a way that the assembly uh, that any member of the assembly can know the code and can really uh, take the way the, the assembly is going on right under itself. And I'm not going to have to So it, it might be bureaucratic at some time, but at least everybody is able to understand how this bureaucracy works, uh, as long as it's a simple bureaucracy.
particularly when we're talking about the CFS, we're completely in a situation where the membership is divorced from the executive at any level. There is zero accountability, and it's a huge problem. Um, and so, like, if we are, you know, moving forward in a way that you know we may want to have our own strikes someday, uh, we need to have the ability to enforce those strikes, or to have it be legitimized on a mass base level, and, and that can only happen at a general. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the strikes happen in Quebec, because I think that's an important uh, factor in the way the unions are structured. Um, when we talk about a student strike in Quebec, we basically talk about a, a period during which we blockade the court. That's basically what the strike is. Uh, for example, when uh, a student union votes for a 24-hour strike, uh, when the strike, uh, well, for example, there's the assembly, uh, the people discuss, then they vote. If the vote uh, is majoritarian uh, in favor of the strike, then on the day that the strike was supposed to happen, uh, it is a small campus, people will blockade the, all the access to the building. And for uh, for example, if it's a departmental strike in a university like here, for example, uh, people will uh, blockade individual classes that are affected by the department. So it's not like an individual choice of people like not going to their classes. It's not just a bunch of during the day, for example, uh, the strike in itself is the, the, the destruction of the process of like dispensing the process. Uh, in Quebec, uh, there is like one day strike every year across. Like uh, the assay, for example, has a traditional uh, one day strike with the protest uh, some, uh, somewhere by the end of March and the beginning of uh, April. The best day to have come to do the one day strike. Um, but uh, on longer cycles, uh, there is what we call the unlimited general strike. Uh, and basically, uh, the unlimited aspect of the strike is to uh, blockade the courses for as long as it takes to win the fight. Uh, so, for example, in 2005, uh, it took six weeks of blockading classes. Uh, and there were more than, uh, at the peak of the strike, there were, there were around 200,000 students locating their classes. Uh, and yeah, and in the 2012 strike, it was like the longest strike that ever happened in Quebec. And it went on for six months. Uh, but usually, strikes are much shorter than that. In the 1974 or 1978 strikes, it was more, more like four weeks or five weeks of locating. Um, and I'm talking about that because uh, the, the one-day strike that I was talking about uh, in itself uh, is not going to win fights. For example, uh, when, uh, when we, we organized uh, a one-day strike in last April against austerity measures, uh, we knew that this one-day strike would not end austerity measures. Uh, but the fact that we do this Monday strike over and over each year uh, is one way the student movement in Quebec had to, uh, to produce uh, its tactics and to produce the legitimacy of the General Assembly to represent the student body. Because outside of uh, strike votes, the General Assembly in Quebec is, uh, the, the General Assemblies of Student Union in Quebec are uh, pretty small. It, may, it might gather uh, one person or two persons of uh, a membership. So, <coughs> for example, on the, on the 2,000 members to the union, there may be a 40 people turn out to the General Assembly. Uh, and this is what usually happens on like downtown. But when we go on the one day strike vote, uh, this can go up 20, 30 percent of the, the membership. And when we go on the general strike vote, it can go up to 50 or 60 percent uh, of the membership. Um, so if the student union stop, if they were to stop doing strikes uh, for four or five years, it might be possible that the, 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 the child democracy will be dying in Quebec because the general assembly will not have like the, the will not have meaning anymore. Uh, 
most people, when they come in college, they have like seven, they are 17 or something like that, 17 or 18. Uh, and they are not like more leftist in Quebec than they are elsewhere uh, in, in North America. But, uh, and usually they don't go to a general assembly because they have no idea what it does. And even though it's participatory and it's open to all, it doesn't mean they want to uh, go there and set up like, having fun with their friends. Uh, but when the, 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 the general assembly votes for a strike, and usually they won't get there if they don't really know what it's about, but when they'll go to school that on the day of the strike and they'll make picket lines, that's where they, they'll understand, in fact, the, the power of the general assembly and the meaning it has. So, yeah, there's a relation between like the one day strike and the legitimacy of the general assembly. I think that's about it for the Quebec model. I don't know if you have a question, you can go ask some question for the Quebec model. Okay. Uh, the general assembly is the department level or university wide level? Uh, that, that depends on if the student union is at the department level or at the university wide level. Uh, there are no uh, Student unions that is campus wide, uh, if the campus is larger than 8,000 members, for example. Uh, for, uh, this, in this university, this is uh, UCAM, uh, there is 40,000 students. There is no campus wide student union. There are only faculty student unions, there are seven of them. Uh, most of them are around five to 6,000 members, and that's the, the, the yeah, and so the general assemblies are uh, faculty based. So, for example, when we go on strike, usually uh, the faculty unions uh, uh, have a meeting to like try to coordinate on which day we go strike, and then they organize general assemblies in each of their faculties. Uh, and well, the, the strike is voted separately. So some of them can be on strike while others are not. So that's why you need to get individual courses instead of uh, the whole campus. And this campus is pretty hard to launch. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit of the in the executive council and the consultation people, like as either one as a finance committee and one as the budget committee. I'm just sort of wondering how like their kind of day to day This is a typical student union in, in uh, CEGEP. Uh, and in CEGEP, uh, the student unions in Quebec uh, have a lot of money, and they can, uh, they, they have like clubs, so there's like a role-playing club, and, uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, they have plenty of clubs. And so uh, usually, uh, just, uh, there is a, like a general assembly for political stuff, and then there's the consultation table uh, for like internal administrative stuff, and this is where like the committee meets and like talk about their stuff. Yeah.
Uh, because this previous union is based on direct democracy, and because it has uh, like a fixed membership, like that uh, includes like everyone in a specific sector or a specific campus, uh, uh, it can help to build a legitimacy on the demands that uh, are voted in general assembly. Uh, it, it, it can build this legitimacy for the students themselves because the General Assembly has a democratic structure and it is open to all of them. It's easier to legitimate, to legitimize them uh, in front of the other students that were not at the General Assembly. Uh, this is different from, for example, on a small group that will say, uh, we'll organize a march for uh, free education, for example. Then it, it can seem for other students that the, the demand of free education comes from an outside group. But if it comes from a group that says this demand was voted in the General Assembly where everybody in this sector will come and the General Assembly was widely uh, announced to anybody, then it's easier to, uh, to legitimize the demand. Um, the same goes for the actions that are voted in the student union. It's easier to legitimize the actions that are undertaken for uh, if it comes from a general assembly of the student union than from an outside political group. Uh, this is true for small scale uh, uh, action, but this is especially true for a strike. For example, if you, uh, if you had a group for free education on campus, and the group for free education decides to blockade classes, it will be hard to explain to students that, well, we blockade classes because we want free education, but if those students were not allowed to vote at the meeting or something like that, it's, it's hard to explain to them. And you, you may have, um, you may antagonize yourself with the, like, the mass of the students, but in the structure we have in Quebec, uh, the, the right wing or the, the ones that are opposed to the strike, it gives legitimacy to the General Assembly because they recognize that the, 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 the structure is democratic, so they participate in the General Assembly, and when they lose, well, they just stay on uh, during the strike. Um, this, this changed a little bit during this strike because the strike was so long that they began, they began to be fed up to the strike, and they tried to go in the tribunal in the conjunction, uh, but still, uh, Yeah, my name is Jesse, I'm from Oshawa, Ontario, so for those who are paying up with the current round. We're about 45 minutes outside of Toronto, and so I've been working organized on my campus. I'll be going into my fifth year, I serve one term of my fifth year, student association. So we're, kind of what was referenced earlier, a long time for the history of our student association. We were basically locked off from the administration. Of course, we have mandatory fees that get dispersed to our student association, but um, in all of our attempts to organize this essay, we have been focused on the political side and the rap side. But now, the focal phase of the administration has withheld our membership fees and refused to be given to the student association to starve, right? So we're running into problems, um, and it's almost like digging a hole to fill back up again. So a bunch of us started a campaign called the Rock and Roll Strike Team, and we worked all through last year. We're, we're organizing this year to a one day strike in the winter semester. Um, and we're, we're doing this probably without the formal support of our student association, and there's no other really politicized or rapid groups on campus. But a little our capacity is growing and growing, and we've seen it grow leaps and bounds over the past year and a half or so. I guess my question to you is, if we're not trying to, we're not going to be attempting, at least at this point, to start a whole new student union, but how do we apply this model um, to an issue-based campaign to organize towards a one-day strike um, or a walkout, um, and how can we do that effectively without Without the, you know, without even the implicit support from our student association that they would back something like that, how do we use it as an issue base that this campaign will probably end up seeing its time run out? But how do we use this model in this and our context? The only way. Uh, in terms of uh, forum, you know, and, and 
association as, as well, not necessarily you know, to, uh, to, to take part in organizing, even though I think you can, but you are forcing them to act upon what the general assembly decides. Okay, so interesting, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to talk about it. But so our last AGM, so our, our SAS AGM, right, more corporate structure than the general assembly structure, but there was a resolution passed by the membership of the AGM to support our campaign financially, logistically, et cetera, but it never materialized. So, um, so I guess your suggestion is to make, try to petition for a general assembly on the specific issue of a walk-in. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and then you can say that, you know, uh, I don't know, like 20% of the, uh, of the membership voted on this. Thank you. 
some general assemblies in like the beginning process. I guess what's most important is uh, is to see about membership and, and what is mobilizing. Uh, so you see what I'm saying? Uh, like, like at, at many of this, this, this was like a lot before the strike, but uh, the students were a lot radicalized and part of all, it was true or uh, There's somebody from the other that sees what you want to do in the city. So, so, so that, that was a hard topic. And, and, and that, that's what mobilized students. Uh, it was, you know, they might not have an opinion or anything, but you just have to see what they want to do. I think they need to act on. Uh, we, we just, we've been trying to do that, and it, and it turns into a very, like, I don't know, people not having, like, direct deaths. So, like, like we have a conversation and like figure out, but then we have trouble like action being afterwards. So it can be kind of like a spokes council model, but it's just difficult to formulate into different committees when you have such a loose membership, especially like, I don't know if this is the same in the United States everywhere, but because we don't have that much traction like built into the system, you know, we're kind of really externalized and we have a difficulty to build in legitimacy. Like what kind of, so you, in the consultation table, and by the way, you work with the model groups, is that like all student groups and this, this, this actually was, was just something that I put up in my little document for like democracy, and I thought it would be interesting to just see the structure, but don't take it as like, okay. a, like a blueprint or something like that. I just kind of quickly give an idea of what it was like at the point, and I think I've got an example because it, 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 it was a, it's a campus that was classified by uh, in the mid to government. So, so after that, like when the strike of time, nothing was happening on the campus. Uh, so we had to work with I consider our experience similar to maybe what's happening after the Quebec of here. So what we had was the General Assembly, obviously, and the
like we're not forming committees right out of the assembly or we're not trying to uh, organize the specifics of the the, the, the products. We don't charge things, for example, uh, there's going to be a product on that day, on this day, and we're going to do a general assembly in three weeks to see if we're going to join some strike or not. And then the executive committee has the, the responsibility to fix the details, to make the the posters, make the hiring, and then usually we have a mobilization committee that is like an open committee for everyone that wants to help, like talking to people and mobilizing with NG and the product as well as voters, uh, where everybody can come and do the work. Is that clear? Yeah, that was really helpful. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the mobilization, is that like a big, like, fluid committee? Or yeah. Is that like, are most of them? Or are they like, like are there specific people who work in each committee or? The, the basic structure is the general assembly, the executive assembly, the executive committee which is elected, and this is fixed number of people, and they are doing the boring work. <laughs> and then there's the mobilization committee where everybody can come, and usually this committee can die sometimes and like come back to life when there are mobilization issue uh, and anybody that wants to work as a campaign can come to the mobilization committee. So the, the, on the long term, the executive committee is crucial to organize the general assembly. It's this committee that is most uh, accountable for the, uh, to the general assembly, but the mobilization committee is where you get people involved directly uh, in like, doing the work. So the mobilization community is the only one where people can go and sit like as they want, or are all committed to be set up that way? I'm sure you said this, I I think it really depends on your own like there's, there's nothing that is wrong. I guess it's, it's more to the idea.
sometimes maybe one or two or three things at those. Uh, and uh, in Quebec, historically, uh, there are two big struggles that went on for general strike. Right? It was uh, special fees and uh, bursaries program for the for That's basically the two issues that managed to gather enough people from the strike. And on campuses, uh, the issues are, really, uh, are usually like the uh, cafeteria or cafe fights. This is like a constant issue. Uh, sometimes it's like security issues, like uh, for putting up the camera at the warehouse. Yeah. And uh, in, uh, I know in Concordia, uh, there's a Palestinian issue that, that managed to uh, involve a lot of people. That's about the issue that are really Yeah, but, uh, but stuff like, you know, uh, uh, the Level drops a little. Uh, this is why, like when 
the, the two other federations, especially FERC, which is the university right-wing uh, student uh, federation, uh, their model is largely based on uh, federation, campus federation that are a member of the like, statewide federation. And uh, this is really problematic for uh, the control, the direct control of the membership. Uh, like, uh, it's maybe not a good phrasing. Anyway, direct democracy is really lacking in that sense. Um, another thing, uh, well, and then when you're building a student union, uh, if you're, it, it might be uh, uh, easy to think like, let, let's do a student union for the old campus when you begin, because uh, at first it might be hard to get people involved. Uh, in the union, so if you go campus-wide, there are more people, so it's easier to have like a meaningful assembly. Uh, but when the progress, when the struggle progress, and when you you try to formalize the student union, uh, like on the campus larger than seven or eight thousand students in Quebec, we have uh, a lot of difficulty to like uh, maintain direct democracy alive. Uh, like there is a there are student unions that gather like 10,000 people, but they have uh, a hard time to get a, a single general assembly to run. Uh, I think that the CSU uh, has a general assembly. But, the, but because the university is like, how yeah, many people? 30,000? Yeah, this is how like. One or two general assemblies. And when they had general assembly, I think it was like abduct general assembly where they tried to bring people up with abduct and then try to be, have some kind of a meeting. So, anyway, uh, so it can be problematic because uh, on the long term, when structuring the student union, uh, if you want to be able uh, one day to do a strike with the student union, it needs to be able to hold the general assembly that will be legitimate for the like the, the, the student body that will be uh, concerned by the strike. Um, and uh, when I went uh, like in Quebec, that it's pretty easy to delimitate uh, student unions because when you go to university, uh, you uh, you go directly in the major or minor. You're already in the geography department. Uh, it's harder to delimitate the exact body of students, even though even if you decide it's going to be a departmental student union, if the first or the two first years are like general classes, uh, it might be hard to well in which student union are these people, and then oh well, it's going to be only the third and fourth year, for example. Well, that can create kind of a mess. Um, I'd like to hear you after that about maybe ideas you can have about how to structure uh, union in this context. Um, there might be solution, for example, saying is a member of the student union everyone that has, it, has at least one class in this department, for example. And this creates the condition to say if we are going to uh, strike, then everyone that is concerned by the strike because they have at least one class then is a member of the student union. For example, that can be uh, a solution. Um, the, uh, when deciding like who could be uh, concerned, like who could be uh, I guess concerned by the, the student union, uh, uh, the size of the student union and the um, homogeneity Body that is come from uh, included in the student union uh, are important factors because, uh, like, uh, uh, like I said, a true large student union can be hard to organize. A smaller or a student union can be easier because you're closer to the people uh, uh, you organize. But on the long term, uh, a very small student union can have a stability problem. Uh, we see this in. Quebec, for example, student unions that are like 100 or 200 members, 
uh, tend to rely on one or two people, and when those people have finished school or the student union, uh, we, um, there are possible ways to organize like a multi-departmental uh, student union, especially if, uh, like, if you don't have any law that uh, prevents you from a trick we are organizing, you are free to decide, like, well, let's say, let's do a art, history, geography, and uh, biology student union because those are our four strong faculty departments. If you don't have this kind of this, uh, all kind of that's right. that's right. yeah. uh, you can go on uh, like that. Um, the, um, yeah, the other the consideration uh, I wanted to share with you, but this is, uh, like I said, Things that I've seen from the outside, if you want to give input on that, that can be a great moment. Uh, if you have any child um, yeah, thinking of how you manage to think of maybe the membership of a union. Thank you. 
That's not uh, LA and Peak. We had uh, we had like, so many departments on strike, uh, uh, and and it, it happened like this because it was very uh, starting from a from a really a spot. We had an assembly.
really acknowledge education issues as something worthy of being on their platform. Um, however, the CFS is still entrenched in sort of an electoral process, very concerned with, with that type of campaigning and lobbying towards uh, members of the parliament. Um, so, similar to some of the uh, unions in, in Quebec, we organize ourselves along the grant formula, uh, trade union lines. So this means that we have things like mandatory dues check off and we have a closed shop model. So automatically, upon entrance to the university, you become a member of the student union when you pay your fees. Um, this has some benefits in the sense that everyone is automatically in, entrenched in that, and they automatically have to, like it forces people to engage with the union. On the other hand, it becomes an unpoliticized choice to, to engage with that union, and it also gives the administration quite a significant amount of power in terms of where our money is coming from. Um, withholding uh, student fees, as mentioned earlier, it's not possible to do that in Quebec, but it is possible to do that in Ontario, and, and does happen. Um, and one of the, the primary issues, too, when we talk about, you know, closed shop unions and the, the CFS model is the idea of this, this student identity. The idea that we are all inherently, you know, changed when we, we enter university instead of bringing our, our identities and our class consciousness with us, we become students right off the bat. Um, and there, in fact, is no material basis for this. Um, we know that, like, there is there are classes within universities. We see this very clearly in, um, you know, the growing levels of uh, proletarian students who can't access higher education, um, when in fact, like most of those proletarian students end up going to, uh, to colleges or, or not at all to secondary education. Um, so when I'm talking about class distinctions, I mean those students who have proletarian interests and those students who have more class interests. Uh, not, um, Sorry, tuition fees can be an example of this uh, and the way that that fights or divides itself. Um, so it is, in fact, in the interest of work less students to keep tuition fees uh, high. This ensures that the institution remain in place. Uh, if any of you have done any sort of organizing around lowering tuition fees in English Canada, you'll know that the lines that repeatedly come up is, I pay a lot of money so my degree's worth something. I'm investing in my future. You know, they don't want poor people tarnishing their, their fancy pieces of paper, I guess, uh, by creating a better access to education. Um, and conversely, it is very much in the interest of proletarian students to have as open, as unbourgeois, and as, as people-based an education as possible. Um, so these internal contradictions result in several things. Um, internal opposition to leftward shifts, which destroys the basis of internal democracy by forcing antagonism to be dealt with in a bureaucratic ma manner. So this means uh, reducing fights to things like referendum, policy changes, uh, and disconnecting the ex executive from the membership. So they're not direct directly accountable, and they can't really speak to any of these contradictions. Um, and this, in turn, reinforces the nation uh, conservatism and reformism that's inherent in the CFS structures. Um, which, and like I said, these things are, are particularly noticeable within the CFS. Um, a lot of organizers and bureaucrats involved in the CFS, uh, and any of you who have experience at, at higher level or, or behind the scenes will know this to be true, uh, often profess uh, a political belief in things like socialism, anarchism, communism, other things of, of a left wing milieu, but often their practice denies any practical application of these ideologies and subordinates all meaningful political goals to small education issues um, and providing services. So this is not to say that education is it should not be a like, primary concern or, or concern for you know the, the betterment of society, but that when we get bogged down in, in those issues and dealing with them in, in a bureaucratic way, it divorces the actual demand and demands from any sort of mass base. Um, and we, like this is why they're often unable to achieve anything and if the membership doesn't they have no agency and no direction in actually choosing those goals. Um, thus, we get ineffective campaigns like drop fees. Uh, I'm sure most of you have at least heard of it. Um, it was also known as education is a right and this year it will be stop the hype. Um, so this, even in the names, you know, drop fees, education is a right.
writes about the hike, you can see an increase in militancy over the past five years or so, from demand to be lowering, from going from lowering tuition to asserting a sort of liberal idea of a right to now asking for just a tuition freeze. Um, um, this doesn't appeal to the membership for a number of reasons. Uh, it offers no real change for proletarian students, um, whether I'm paying $16,000 a year or, and that stays the same for the next couple of years, it doesn't really matter to me, I'm still going to be in debt when I get out of school. Um, and and it, it's completely irrelevant for a student to pay for education, um, or at least can get out of it with a significantly lower level of debt and usually have jobs waiting for them, that must be nice. Um, <laughs> So uh, mass, like there's no mass base, like I said, and because all students are, because they're necessarily involved in this coach shop model, uh, the union has no way of mediating these contradictions, and in fact denies their existence through the creation of this identity which we call student. Um, so compared to the, the Quebec uh, campaign movements for, for lowering and freezing tuition that have been long off
complicated system. The long and short of it is that when I came on campus four years ago, we were a member of the College Student Alliance, uh, which was affiliated with USA. USA and CSA are essentially like government, you know, uh, front organizations. So every time the government increases tuition, these organizations come out and say it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and every time an election comes around, they give half-hearted, uh, you know, demands to the parties, and then they end up retracting the anyway. Um, and they're very, they're not democratic at all. Um, and I tried to get involved in CSA when I was uh, elected in my student association. We were successful in decertifying from CSA, which was great because we're not really, really explicitly right wing group now. Uh, but when I first came on campus, I had heard of CFS, right? So I had never been a student activist before that. I was an activist in other realms uh, before I became a church student. And CFS was at the time, you know, like a breath of fresh air. Oh my God, there's an organization talking about equity. They're talking about lowering fees and things that our campus just didn't exist, right? Um, now, over the past three years, um, I was actually, I pushed the motion at our AGM to become prospective members of the Federation, which the administration for our school shut down. Uh, and I, that was one of the details that happened, but the, the moral of the story is they shut it down. I'm actually, it's been a blessing in disguise now, actually. However, where my question lies is, coming from a conservative campus who has been depoliticized for 40 or some odd years, um, and with a new university where I was doing only around 10 years, we have the highest fees in Canada at UIT, where uh, my tuition is $10,000 a year at UIT, and international students are still paying $22,000. So we come from a very depoliticized, conservative history, um, and what I'm what I'm worried about in our organizing is how do we meet people where they are, um, and how do we sell the option that CFS is too right wing when it was really hard to even convince them that CSA and USA were too right wing, right? Um, so how do we fill that void with something progressive without opening it up to because um, our school for this context quickly is heavily science and engineering based. So there's a natural conservative bent to our campus. Um, and how do we make sure that void is filled with a progressive radical option um, and instead of opening up that void for more conservative students to come in um, and, and fill that void before we are because they're better organized than we are? Uh, I don't want to give any thoughts on that. And that struggle between yes, no CFS, but how do we not alienate people in the process of trying to fill this on the campus uh, by rejecting everything? Yeah, that's a really good question. Honestly, um, it's been sort of uh, an issue that we've been struggling with in a lot of ways. Like we have uh, members that were involved in the General Assembly campaign who actually actively campaigned to bring the CFS in uh, when they were in their, their first and second year and now are, are looking back on that time that's like, oh my god, what was I thinking? Um, and so I, all I can say, is, and I'll cover some of this in later in the, is it later in the presentation, is that you really need to decide what it is you're fighting for and make that very explicit and, and find a point in which you demarcate from the CFS. And it's gonna be confusing, I'm not gonna lie, it's gonna be, you're gonna have a lot of long, really frustrating one-on-ones with people, but um, at the end of the day, like it, the CFS is, is inherently like anti-democratic in a lot of ways and, and that needs to be stressed and, and through that struggle and, and, and that sort of demarcation, you'll, you will win it, it seems hard when you're small, but there, there's a direct correlation between like how much you struggle and how much you actually get out and talk to people on campus and how much support you'll gain. Um, so I can't do much other than be encouraging. I saw there's a hand back there and then there's a fellow here and then you. Different people, different practices, etc., are taking place in different parts of the country. Um, and the 
one thing that I do want to stress and emphasize that I am here on behalf of the Federation. I'm the National Committee Chairperson, so that's what we go, so we'll continue. Uh, but I do want to invite folks if you have questions about internal structure, referenda, how things happen. I don't really want to get into a debate here because I feel like we should be talking about, I'm really interested in talking about general assemblies so and how this function and whatnot, so I feel like that's where the discussion should be. Uh, but if people do have questions about internal structure, et cetera, what's been going on, I really do want to make myself a point person so that people can come and talk to me about it. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to caution against sort of painting a large brush here because I think that certainly I'm interested in being here and bringing about how direct democracy works um, and how we can implement that more so in other parts of the country. Um, but I do want to emphasize again that like, I've been by no means the way we've organized for the past three years in Manitoba. Have we been tough as a game state government or end like their years being or whatever? Uh, we have had a very long, hard struggle for the past decade in Manitoba. Uh, we've seen the NDP government actually legislate to achieve behavior reasons. So go for like, Freezing them for almost half a decade to actually now seeing those people about every single year. I'm sorry. Uh, I just, I cannot be careful and, and speak like way slower because us that uh, have learned English as a first language are like, oh my god. <laughs> sure, I'm trying to not take up too much space because I didn't want to. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, yeah, like, um, too like. Yeah, so uh, I actually think this is a pretty good form to have that debate about the CFS because I think it's one of the seven questions facing the student movement in English Canada right now. Um, and so just to add to what the comrade up front said, like I'm also an organizer with the Revolutionary Student Movement at UR Law. I'm, I'm the person that she's referencing that helped bring the CFS in my first year. Uh, I was incredibly active on the campaign when we federated in, I want to say 2008. It was like, yeah, November 2008. Um, and if I could go back, I'd kick myself in the head and call myself out of water. Uh, it's been the single biggest demobilizing aspect of the left on our campus. Uh, we went from having an incredibly vibrant left that was able to organize uh, quite effective actions, that once we got sucked into that bureaucratic structure that is the CFS, um, it, it was just demobilizing. Like we had people more concerned about the providing of services, the, uh, professionalism, things like that. And so it, it's, I've seen the degeneration of the left uh, at U Ottawa over the past six years that I've been there, um, and, and like I, I completely disagree with the things that you're bringing up. Regardless of whether or not the NDP is mobilizing against this or that NDP government provincially, the politics that can be the CFS advances are fundamentally social democratic. And so it's like the extent to which they're against the NDP is the extent to which the NDP is acting like a social democratic party or a liberal party at any given point. But the politics are the same. And for English Canada, we need to be able to push left and push past that. And the CFS is a barrier to that. Um, I sort of want to in relation to what we said also the, the, the previous uh, comment, uh, question. Um, I think you know there are folks actually campaigning uh, to be very late in CFS, um, but uh, the U of S, the like USSU was part of the CFS and liberated, and but the same structure remains. So it's not a matter of you know with which federation is affiliating, which, which union is affiliating, which, uh, which federation. It's a, it's a, the issue is a bureaucracy, right? So it's a, I, 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 I agree with the, the derivation of the CFS, but it's like, it's the, even if the student union becomes not affiliated with any either CFS or it's uh, the bureaucracy remains, so it's a bigger, bigger issue. Okay, so when we're going to the back,
got into the membership debate with CFS. This was a way that right wing students managed to like ship all mobilization on campus towards a debate about CFS, right? And then there was this total vacuum of any kind of progressive organizing. So I just want to caution on like seeing. I also I also want to say I, I agree that there is a real uh, a problem in English speaking Canada in terms of lack of mobilization, and this relates to leadership problems in CFS. Uh, but it's also it's a question of like how do we break out the kind of defensive position we're right? um, and uh, and we can do that without without just playing into like tearing each other apart, like uh, like attacking the CFS team and seeing the CFS as like the main enemy. Uh, enemy. Like no, the main enemy is uh, uh, the corporations, capitalism, and their governments that are that are blocking the uh, nation. So if we, if we can mobilize on that basis against the real enemy, then we'll start to see the, the structural changes and the you know structure and mobilization, political mobilization go hand in hand. We can't, we can't just set up the perfect structure without having that political mobilization. Just, uh, one thing I wanted to mention uh, that I forgot to, um, this question of whether, like, as another you know, comrade of said, as I repeated, that CFS uh, English can right like now uh, to radical student mobilizing. It's not that the CFS uh, is particularly important in the day-to-day -day lives of students. In actual fact, I think one of the best arguments against the CFS is that it actually does very little and mobilizes very few people. The danger lies in subordinating your organizing efforts into it. And so when we talk about, like, who the real enemy is, I, I think that's, uh, you know, a bit of a cop out. Yeah, of course, capitalism is the real enemy, but the enemy is also all of those forces that demobilize students, and the CFS is one of those forces. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, just so quickly, I mean, I like it's, it's wonderful to hear that there are other CFS levels that are actually able to be breaking from that. Um, that being said, I, I would be interested to hear what precisely those gains are. How do you see it? Like, if, if the government's coming in and, and raising tuition, it's, at that point, it's it's not a question necessarily of, well, it is because it has something to do with structure, but it, it's the type of, of structure we're using and the tactics and the way we're achieving the goals we set forward. Um, so in the in the places where it's confederated, I'm, I'm really sort of not um, set off at all by, by this idea of, of being divisive uh, and letting the right in. We have to contend with the right, uh, whether we have a CFS um, if we are unable to contend with them purely on the basis of not having the CFS, then we seriously need to think about the way that we're organizing ourselves politically. Um, we're, we're not seeing gains struggle, and we need to have a united and clear vision if, if we're going to move forward without the CFS. And, and I think that's part of why we're here and we're talking about general assembly. Um, like mobilization is, is not just a question of culture, it's a question of structure, but it's also a question of political will. And, how we reach that political unity and political support. Um, so, so moving on to the specifics of the campaign, so maybe the, the American folks in the room can, can glean a bit more from what I'm saying um, instead of uh, infighting. Um, <laughs> so um, what the heck did we actually do in Ottawa and how can it be applied to other places? Um, so first off, it's important to note that the political approach we chose um, is that like is that a mass line. Um, so mass line can be adequately understood in a series of principles, the first of which is from the masses to the masses. Uh, what we mean by this is following um, as organizers, uh, uh, this is the following. As organizers, we generally have a certain set of politics. Um, I'm a communist, uh, others may be socialists, anarchists, uh, etc. However, at this point, the majority of masses and, and students on campuses don't identify with those ideas and, and don't really have any about, you know, you can ask someone, well, what, what do you really want to come out of this? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Uh, and so, uh, like, part of our job as organizers is to, is to help synthesize that. So, because they do have very legitimate grievances in the system, and we know this because we live in those same material conditions, and, and these are the material conditions that let us to these ideas, and, and it, it's there, we just need to agitate. Um, so, we have to go, and we have to listen to their grievances, and synthesize those with our politics and bring them back to those things as demands. Uh, this is not to say we should be condescending to students, but working, working with them uh, and, and integrating ourselves with each other. That's not a hard goal considering you know, we are a part of those struggles and making decisions with ourselves. Um, so as we connect with the masses, we're, we're raising their political level and struggling together in unity. Um, as such, 
uh, we decided to take on the campaign based on a number of factors. Uh, the first being the respect that we have for what is achieved in its recent strength and the historical example of militancy within the fixed community. Uh, we also identified a lack of engagement within our local. Uh, most students do not care about the student elections. Uh, they see the objective as bureaucrats, rightly so, uh, who are only seeking for votes.
or in the case of, of the bureaucrats and the people affiliated with the existing structure, uh, limit the power of the General Assembly. Uh, so we refer to these as, as the backward elements, um, and the, those with an anti-democratic political outlook. So what's interesting to note about this is that um, we, like, as has maybe adequately been shown from the discussion, as the RSM are, are one of the only student groups putting forward a, a critique of the CFS formally. Um, that's not to say that there isn't uh, dissension in other places. Um, and, and we actually found that uh, contrary to being divisive, uh, it was actually a, a, a really great organizing tactic and didn't attract any unwanted uh, like right-wing um, attention or uh, sympathy. Um, so in terms of outright opposition, um, we, so the way the referendum works at Uottawa and most of you in your have similar uh, bylaws. Um, so when you initiate a referendum, you take on the yes side of the campaign, and then there's always an option for any other student to take on a no side of the campaign. Um, in this case, uh, the no campaign was essentially self-isolating. Uh, the first re referendum all they did was add a paper to the cost, which essentially uh, amounted to a little bit of face controlling, and that, that was about it. Uh, the, second, the second referendum, they got their, they got their stuff together a little bit, and uh, put up a web page. Um, they didn't do any on the ground organizing. They didn't put up any posters. They, because there is fundamentally, because of, of the type of politics that's in, involved in the right, they don't really have that understanding of, of going to people and organizing them on a, on a mass basis. And so they really are unable, or at least in our case, were unable to gain any sort of traction. Um, they also resorted uh, in a lot of cases to fear mongering about the possibility of a strike vote. Uh, to which, which we undermine, of course, by being open about the fact that we are in favor of a strike. Of course, let's strike, let's do it. This is why Quebec is able to achieve uh, lower tuition fees and, and it's, it's a tried and true tactic. Um, and, and uh, sorry, we, we often had, were faced with explaining to students that we were in favor of striking, but that it, it was fear mongering in a sense because uh, although it's a, an effective and political tactic, we are still far away from organizing a strike. It's, it's going to be a lot of preparation and work. We're perhaps looking, looking towards doing a one-day strike in the near future, but again, there's lots of planning and mobilization and, and mass uh, involvement that needs to go into this before we can actually be achieved and enforced. Um, in terms of those elements that we're seeking to limit power of the GAs, again, um, again, I'm specifically speaking about the executive uh, who are the highest decision-making body of the Student Federation. Uh, we, we dealt with them in two ways. Um, first, we created a referendum question which these elements were unable to support. Uh, so our question read, uh, do you agree that General Assembly should be made the highest decision-making body of the SFUO with control of, but not limited to, policy, bylaw, finance, and elections? Um, we also drafted a list of 10 essential features of the GA, uh, which unfortunately I, I can't remember, but it included uh, some the ability of the uh, GA to impeach executives uh, without a representative <coughs> process. So, it, like building that direct accountability was was really important for us. Um, well, this latter point also gave us uh, the insurance for when the referendum came around that we could be ensured that the. Or sorry, uh, we also got the uh, the executives around election time to sign pledges uh, that they were in support of, of the structure. So this gave us a little bit of insurance in terms of them not being able to back out of their pro uh, promises and having something that we could hold up to the, the collective of students at Joao and say, look, they promised us this, and it's a very concrete thing, and, and like it wasn't the first one. Um, and over the course of the campaign, we discovered that ultimately the Social, Democratic, uh, Social Democrats were also unable to mobilize. Uh, they had managed to isolate themselves through their bureaucratic practice, and we already sort of know this through the experience of, of the broader CFS largely fail on our campus, um, but they were really only able to exist because of this the seven million dollar budget that the university is allowing them to have. So there, there really wasn't um, there was opposition, but the time and, and the place was was perfect for these mobilizing conditions. And despite the fact that it seemed as though everyone was apathetic and demobilized, we were able to to very easily um, spark that initiative. initiative. 
Um, so in the end, the GA fight was not only success successful, but great for advancing uh, revolutionary uh, politics at Elon Musk, and raising the political consciousness of the, the campus in, in doing that struggle. Um, the membership of the RSM, in particular, tripled in size, um, and we opened up a space for radical and revolutionary politics, and, as well as the GA itself, which of course should be a space for, for progressive, radical, and, and revolutionary politics as well. Um, and now we, we are known as only, one of the only groups on campus who's actively fighting uh, for the interests of working class students. Um, so for us at U Ottawa and for the RSM, it was a huge victory. Uh, we became the first school in English Canada to institute uh, real general assemblies, which are the highest decision making body of our student uh, We think it's significant. Uh, we're pretty proud of ourselves. Uh, and we provided a real al alternative model for the rest of English Canada to follow. And, uh, now, like I was referencing before, it, it is impossible for any bureaucrat in English Canada to say that GAs are something that is unique to Quebec for cultural reasons, which has been a huge hindrance uh, for us. Um, so, but in the broader scheme of things, why why do you, you know talk about general assemblies and fighting for them and direct democracy? So, um, these are our small fights in, in terms of, of the larger. Uh, scale of, of politics in Canada, but unless we start to see these small fights as a part of a larger plan to overthrow capitalism as a part of a social uh, goal larger than campuses we organize on, we will ultimately remain ineffective and unable to achieve our broader political goals, namely the end of capitalism, and by extension, uh, free mass-based education in the service of people, which is ultimately what we're talking about, we're talking about accessible, free education, which is something that is inherently contradictory to any form of capitalism, including social democracy. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the end of my spiel. Um, so for anyone nervous about trying this at their school, again, it's important to remember that it's a dialectical relationship, and it's not only it's talking about general assembly, starting any sort of student union or mass-based group. Um, it's a two-sided give and take uh, between engaging in political activity and how much growth and support the game. Again, so uh, comrades dare to struggle and dare to win. Um, if anyone would like to talk to me at any point during the weekend, please approach me. I'm really nice, I promise. Um, <laughs> um, and I think we're going to go into a broader discussion period now. So thanks. <laughs>
target that you say can take on. Uh, because ultimately, uh, I'm going to give two examples. Uh, in Quebec, the government decided to raise questions. We know that because we have a long history of student strike, we knew that if we were well prepared and with a bit of luck, we could manage to uh, do a statewide uh, student strike and then manage to build leverage enough to uh, force the government to uh, back up. Uh, but, uh, for example, there was a, a teacher strike here in the camp in 2009. Uh, it was a normal labor union strike, but it was a long strike. Uh, and they, 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 their demands were largely, uh, uh, they, they asked uh, at a university uh, for a budget that the university didn't have. But the, the, the leverage was uh, strong enough for the university to go the government and ask for, for money because uh, the government needed for the, the strike to end at some point, so it needed to intervene. And because the, the teachers had the support of the student union that went on strike to the camp, then the, the, university, the, the government could like, make a special bill for the teachers back, uh, uh, to work on the pretext that the student wanted to go to school because students were on strike too. So, uh, Leverage was strong enough for the government to intervene there. So uh, my guess will be uh, uh, if you can take on a higher level government, uh, usually it's better because it has more power to come uh, to your demand. But if your uh, if your uh, actions are strong enough, uh, even on a local scale, uh, it can force the administration to uh, take to ask for more money from a higher level. Yes, yes. Um, I have a question. Um, when I was working at the University of Manitoba, um, our, like, our students team, we talked about it in general sometimes, actually. Um, we talked about it in the context of, like, because, just to give some context, maybe uh, our students Thank you. 
calculated that are on to reach all the students, uh, you know, like, uh, very systematic way. Uh, so you have that, but also, I guess, you, you also want to build your argument in some sense, in terms of why you want to have the you because you do have to come in students, you know, like, they have very amazing reasons for the other democracy to have the GA, but the students need to see the value as well. So, so like, if you can highlight some of the issues, uh, uh, I don't know, just, just kind of maybe like making it part of, of, of something that's happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about direct democracy, but it, it seems to be clear that the GA model, uh, in fact, is not like a perfect direct democracy. Uh, the, 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 the perfect direct democracy will imply is that uh, everyone will be equal, will have equal entrance on the decision, so that means they will have equal information and equal time to speak. And uh, of course, this contains panels of time that are largely uh, that, that we don't have. So uh, the, 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 we talk about direct democracy, but what we really, really talk about is about ways to organize that are more democratic. Yeah, but I'm going to check that. That the representative models. Uh, in the end, it's sure that there is no way to build a perfect general assembly where everybody can be there. But uh, a process in which 50 or 60 people show up on a regular meeting and uh, decide the general uh, orientation of the campaign and organize it, and then an open mobilization committee that helps at the at the realization of this action plan. Uh, will build a stronger internal legitimacy on the campaign than it is on the restricted uh, six or seven people executive uh, elected committee. Um, and this, this, this distinction is important. And it, the, uh, we can think of the Quebec movement, we can think of the General Assembly as something that uh, is, uh, is sometimes uh, legitimate after the, the assembly took place. I'm going to explain. Uh, for example, uh, if there is a uh, one, one or two persons of the campus go on a GA and vote, I don't know, uh, 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 for the revolution, <laughs> then uh, the, the, the executive sends the, 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 the resume of the, the assembly to all of its members. If the members disagree, the structures are made in such a way that the people can petition to, uh, to have a new general assembly and then the right-wing people will come and say, no, that's not right, and they're, they're going to be able to reverse the decision if they are if you, if you put That kind of structure uh, uh, ensure that there is a legitimacy to the decision even if the, the, the general assembly is not that big. Uh, and the, <coughs> what I'm trying to say is that the possibility of a right backlash is not a bad thing. Uh, but, and, and this is also useful as organizers because uh, when we think of building a mass movement, what we need to think is, uh, I, I like our sentence, we, we have a, we, we call it in a different way, we say, uh, unite the left, rally the center, and isolate the right. Uh, but anyway, so as long as we keep thinking like that, uh, it, it becomes possible of rally at a Anyway, include more people in the process, even though the process is not perfect in itself. And another thing I wanted to say, you said that uh, in our law, the the board, the board of trustees or something like that, they can, yeah, can like decide. Like the board of directors. Okay. Uh, what I wanted, wanted to say is that in Quebec too, the, the formal law says that the General Assembly has a very marginal uh, importance. Uh, basically, student unions are not structured according to what the government wants us to be structured like. The student unions have the General Assembly as the supreme body uh, because students decided they will work that way in their own structures. In fact, we don't really respect what the law wants us. And uh, another thing I, 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 I forgot to mention, and it's close to that, that uh, there is no law that says we have the right to strike in Quebec. Technically, it's illegal. We cannot block it fast. But because uh, students recognize the, the, the legitimacy of the general assembly, 
uh, they usually don't contest the, 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 the strike. And because, uh, uh, yeah, and, and so because they don't contest the strike, the government is in a really bad position to try to put an end to the strike uh, without the, 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 the that's all. Yeah, the agreement of the, but of the students themselves. Uh, yeah. Okay, I have a question uh, specifically for Alex, but not just for Alex. Uh, you mentioned that uh, not all students have the same economic interest, which is definitely true, but uh, I'm wondering how much of a practical barrier that is. I think the way that that has been addressed in Quebec has basically been that you don't organize in places where uh, you expect students are going to be against you and organize in places where you think you can get some kind of a, a significant majority of students to support what you're, what you're trying to do. So I'm wondering, like, do you think that's necessarily a very, I mean, there's such a lot of American students here, and I think the, the school system is more economically segregated than it is in Canada. Uh, so I'm wondering how much of a practical barrier you think that is. Um, like, I think it's a, pa a practical barrier everywhere. I think it's a question of at which, at which point those contradictions become particularly acute, right? In English Canada right now, they're, they're very acute because the schools are overrun with, like, students who have a very privileged class background. Like, and it's becoming increasingly so because of the rise in tuition, uh, because of the militant history in the Quebec, like I said earlier, there is a, it, it is a different tradition, and, and those bourgeois students make up a much minority because of the organizing and the presence of, of working class students. Um, to speak to uh, the comments from the USA, um, I mean, if, you, if we're talking about bourgeois and proletarian students, it, it may fall closer on a I'm not sure. I, I don't do a lot beyond the ground organizing that, that you wealthy people do. Um, but I, I do think it is a barrier, and it, it's a question about which point, you know, do we, does it become a problem? And it's, it's definitely a problem right now in English Canada. I think in Quebec it, it could become a problem if we're talking about a situation in which we want to make the university completely accessible and open. Most of the students, if they truly have bourgeois interests and aren't subjectively um, in think interests are not going to be in favor of that because for reasons I said before. You know, they, they feel as if the higher tuition gives value to their degrees, that it's really something special to be earned. Um, and this is, is not in the interest of, of a large amount of population.
it's about transforming ourselves into agents as opposed to like consumers or IT sort of like people but we like experts. But we know what's wrong. We you know from our own lives and realities we live in, you know, it's you know things are not uh very interesting people to make students, right? So um so I mean, what I'm just saying is that the process is very important and you know only through practice you can you know learn or apply Challenge it openly and like you know, like I guess in group and yeah, I think we're going to go. Hi. Um so I'm interested in the French one of the English Canadian University of Canada. I'm kind of I'm interested in working at Dallas uh, University in Halifax. I just took the comment we should have passed up uh, this year. We still eventually go up and I'll see that. So what I wonder though, because we have this um apolitical thing that we're trying to escalate, I worry that we're going to GA at a university wide level community, but we don't want to make the things we not go to. So do you think that that would be more effective to do it as multiple GAs to the department to the faculty rather than the same way university? Yeah, like I mean ultimately I think
kind of accommodation that we uh, uh, in here. Uh, in I think this has been a big debate. Uh, just after the strike, there was an orientation congress, like there's a longer congress with like uh, a lot of uh, texts that were written on that issue to try to, uh, to make assay and good union better. Um, and uh, I guess the conclusion by thinking a lot about this is that uh, democracy and direct democracy is not like some like it's not a, a position of principle that when you say it and when you try to put it in action, just like springs up. Uh, the, the fact that we uh, trying to make that direct democracy live is a struggle against the entire system that tries to take uh, our time away to the capitalist model of production, that tries to take our time away so that we don't have have the time to uh, organize politically. And so holding a general assembly is a, is a sort of political work. Just I, I can't think the general assembly is a, is a political choice uh, that engages people in not doing something else and uh, possibly sacrificing part of the possibilities that capitalism could have given them, for example, you could have thirty in a better grade of so there is kind of an uh, involvement uh, in going to the GA and organizing the GA is even harder. And then trying to make the GA uh, a space of uh, equal participation of uh, yeah, our safe space is uh, another amount of work that we need to do. So uh, we need to set uh, realistic goals in what we can do and then try to always improve it in practice because it, we can theoretically uh, talk a lot about what we could do to make it uh, more equal, but uh, the reality is always like in front of us and uh, putting inequalities, uh, those things, reproducing these inequalities. So for example, uh, in Quebec, uh, we, we, there is something that is called Gatling.
guilty as charged. <laughs> Je sais, je sais, un euh, matin, euh, José avec. Euh, non, euh, dans l'autre local, le, le, le 110. C'est quand, c'est quand, c'est quand, c'est quand, c'est quand, c'est quand, 
Ça a été ça nous a parlé de la crève, comment est-ce que le monde avait débarqué comme ça. C'est 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 Ouais, fait que là, je vais juste rester comme le dimanche matin, puis le samedi matin. Samedi après-midi, dimanche matin. Ouais, c'est ça. Très bien. Et il euh, n'y a rien à sur YouTube, rien. Je vais prendre 30 secondes juste en montrer ça vite, là. Parce que ça donne euh, une vidéo. Euh, 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 ils sont en ordre de journée, là. Ça, c'est hier. Ça, ici, le son est bon. Oui, ici, le son est bon. Ensuite de ça, euh, ben, aujourd'hui, c'est ce qu'on a jusqu'à la date. Ils sont tous, euh, c'est tout du 4 gig. Chaque euh, carré, là, chaque clip, c'est le 4 gig. Euh, euh, ça ça va. C'est un fait que les settings du film, ça m'a à plus de 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 Mike check, 
that's that's one two. Again? Okay, c'est bon, passé. So I will postulate today that uh, success in a good media strategy relies on 
on success in mastering uh, three aspects. The first one being tribute, as in how we take our place uh, in the public sphere. The second being knowledge, uh, as in how we relate to information as activists. And the third being language, as in how we define our own struggle. So in terms of tribute, uh, why is it important to develop the means of access to tribute? Uh, we tend to overlook this aspect in regards to a certain purity of our message, as we don't want we don't want our message to be promoted, say in a newspaper on the same page as car dealer uh, ads or insurance company ads. Or to another extent, we don't want uh, some ideas, some of our ideas, to be promoted in an alternative newspaper which doesn't share the same stand, the same exact stance as us on the way to overthrow capitalism. So, in any way, we are confronted to the inability uh, of some journalists or media to understand what we are fighting for. And a good example of this will be the enduring ignorance uh, of some journalists towards the operation of the General Assembly or a Congress. That's something that we lived through uh, in 2012 during the strike. So, how can we convince people through them if we don't even understand how our organizations work? And on the other hand, if we refuse altogether to use mainstream media to spread our ideas, we run the risk of preaching only to people who are already aware of the issues and share our views uh, towards them. So it's a very interesting issue. Uh, I'll let my, for the first, for this first aspect of tribute, I'll let my colleagues uh, fill you in more with these contradictions and this aspect of the debate. I'll focus more on the conditions of knowledge and uh, language. So knowledge, of course, is also a basic condition when you build a media strategy. Spreading ill-founded information, or, or misleading your ally, or even your opponent, uh, can easily discredit the movement. So some of the issues we face as activists in regards to knowledge are the questions of access to information and production of knowledge. There are many different ways uh, to consider access to information. The more obvious being the, act, the actual act of uh, gaining access to government or business-based information through legal means or laws. So it's also an easy way for government and other authority structures to put pressure on activists by manipulating, one way or another, uh, which information is transmitted and how it's transmitted, but also its production. Uh, so as an example, uh, here in Canada we have uh, something that's called the Law for Access, uh, I'm not, not sure what the translation is, but right that. So it's the Law for Access on Information. So like, as a citizen, you can, uh, put a request to have access to some documents that were previously uh, unavailable from the government. So in your 2011 annual report, Information Commissioner of Canada, Suzanne Legault, mentioned that the federal government of Canada reduced its cooperation with citizens, be they journalists, activists, or else, uh, towards demands of access to information. So the number of demands refused for security reasons tripled since 2003. And most queries aren't met with a complete deletion of the information requested. So we are there's an, an increasing there, there are increasing obstacles for citizens, activists, and journalists to have access to this information and to build uh, to build solid arguments and solid uh, campaigns based <coughs> on such information. To another extent, budget cuts and watchdog organizations, publicly financed statistical tools such as the Canadian Census, which got uh, reduced uh, and public research and comes to public research facilities, especially uh, when we uh, relating to environment and social issues, uh, greatly affect our means of producing well-founded knowledge and thus to criticize new and existing public policies. So let's say uh, as an example, the government, the federal government <coughs> actually, I think it was two years ago, of the uh, uh, like fired 600 uh, researchers in, in, in Environment Canada. So this is like the Ministry of Environment, which produced information on how our lakes are polluted, on what's happening with the endangered species and such, and so and also watching for global warming signs. And so by by uh, laying up all these people and by stopping many research projects. You prevent, uh, you prevent uh, activists, environmental activists, to produce 
uh, and I can show like solid criticism of government policies towards the environment. So this is, this has been a big uh, a big blow to uh, environmental uh, struggles in Ghana. So once we are confronted to such uh, destruction of our means to gain information, public information, how can we effectively denounce the destruction? say, of maritime, maritime ecosystems, if you don't have any up-to-date information uh, to back it up. <coughs> How, in the same perspective, can we effectively denounce the oppression of Aboriginal people without census facts to back us up? As we want to denounce such behaviors, we need to be able to produce reliable sources of information, reliable research, and reliable, reliable arguments to defend our values and ideas. And if we can't obtain costly statistical facts to support our claims, and even if we do have statistical uh, info and such, we need to find alternative information. We have to go out and film what's happening. We have to document repression. We have to show them, show the, the public that poverty is real, and we have to do it in a way that they can't deny it. So we need to be able to produce, to, to be, to produce our own information, to produce our own, uh, you know, like newspapers and stuff like that. Uh, which brings me to language, the issue of language. Uh, as activists, it's completely fundamental that we be able to define our struggles and our fights, uh, our collective demands, in our own words and meanings. We must, by our adversaries and enemies, we need to speak for ourselves. Uh, too often, we take that aspect for granted and rely on others to define us. How many times did we hear, like, like how many times were we encouraged to think that as long as the media speaks, speak about us, we'll get to be known. It's a good thing. You know, we're better to be talked. It's better to have, a, like, to be talked about in a local newspaper than in a negative way than to be talked about. So, as as an example of how that's uh, that can be bad, let's look at what happened here in 2012. And how the struggle for education uh, was also and also still is happening in the field of language. So, though both the students and the provincial government spoke the same time, be it French in this case, uh, the language used was very different and at the, at the heart of strong disagreements. And not just between students and the government, but between uh, activists and their parents, between uh, employees and their bosses. So, the word violence, as an example, had a very different meaning, has a very different meaning depending on who used it. For the government, it means broken windows, people blocking up bridges and campuses. It means undisciplined dissent. As for us students, it had a completely different and yet evocative meaning. Uh, it referred to people being beaten up by cops in the street on a daily basis. It referred to legal procedures uh, being engaged by the government and by administrations to try and stop us from doing the, the strike. It was a... Uh, it was... It was a, a it was a it meant also never-ending threats by university and college administrations to cancel our uh, our sessions. It will, it, but there is also the symbolic violence and very real oppression of capitalism. So the word violence in itself has some very different meanings, and in, in the context of something like the strike of 2012, people will take sides, and then you got like a trench. The same argument can be made with uh, the word democracy or uh, even education. In fact, there seems to be an increasingly deep trench, as I said, between protesters and authority in terms of language to the point that we both understand each other if we took for granted that the enemy used the same language. So when the mainstream media described protesters, uh, general assemblies, congresses, it was often by using a negative language that depicted us as dangerous, spoiled, or even deranged people. This can be particularly dangerous if we consider that language as a constitutive value and builds our reality. People whose only contact with protesters or direct actions is through TV screen uh, might take for granted that what they see and hear is the reality, regardless of the interpretation or, or of the employees of the TV station and regardless of what has been omitted by uh, what you see on TV. Or, uh, so in order to fight against such misunderstandings, uh, when comes the time to convince people of our ideas, uh, be it through well-established media authority or alternative media outlets, 
we need to be able to transmit exactly what we mean to say, and we need to take the necessary steps to explain the meaning of our words and why we chose those, why we choose those words and why we chose words that have such meaning. We need to be able to understand our own actions too. Why is this protest legitimate? Why is this action legitimate? Why is this strike legitimate? We need to be able to express it. We need to be able to, to understand why we are doing such a thing. So if we are not able to define our struggles in our own words, we are letting our adversaries and enemies frame the debate for us, thus confining us in a public space where our interventions only reinforce the legitimacy. So as an, as an example, uh, from the strike once again, uh, will the Quebec movement have grown so much in size if we agreed to discuss only about the financial issue of the Tushinai? So, just uh, as a reminder, the financial issue of the students of the of the strike, of the sorry, of the tuition hike, uh, was what the government had in mind. They wanted us to go and sit at a table with them and talk about the hike, the hike, just numbers. They want, they wanted to do this hike, but they didn't they didn't want us to like talk about canceling it or something. All they asked of us was like, well, do you don't agree on the price? Maybe it can, can be higher or like a bit cheaper? No, that's not what we want. We wanted to talk about education and democracy. And so that's why we bring the debate otherwise, to speak about education and democracy. That were uh, real issues at hand for us. So basically we managed to flip the table in that sense. Because even though many critics did not agree with our views, they had to recognize that the real debate was not about numbers anymore, but it was about education and democracy. So I will not be the judge of whether we should build our communication strategies around mainstream media, alternative media, or both, as my colleagues will, uh, will speak about this issue in a moment. But uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that we need to give ourselves the logistic, document, documented, and linguistic means to build a successful media strategy. And that language is particularly important in that sense that we need to be, uh, to be able to define our own struggles and to, uh, to be able to send the real message we want to send.
and you have another song, which is more, you have to play the game, you have to talk to the media, you have to reach a large part of the population, and you have to build up professionalized strategies. So you have to be specialized, you have to understand how it, work, how it works, and how to use all the tools that you have access. I'm generalizing because it's a continuum, you know, there's people in the middle, more out of the media, or all the way, so you understand what I mean. Um, and in ASLI, more specifically, it's an organization who is, uh, they want to do combative syndicalism, you know, if we're going to build uh, a big mobilization, big struggle, and uh, the part of our action is there. And you have other uh, student organization who the central part of their, their action is to use the media and to do lobbyism. And Quebec uh, historically have been clashing in these two way of approaching the media. And what's interesting is that in 2012, the big strike everyone is talking about is, what's interesting is that uh, the two sides became more blended. You know, the one that always do lobbies and public relations strategies uh, became a little bit more combative. And as they became a little bit more into public strategy relations, was able to uh, be professional, professional in uh, that, that you can And me, obviously I'm here because I think it's uh, a good way to, uh, I think you have to in integrate the mass media in your political strategies as a, a social movement. Uh, because I'm, I like to think of myself as, as some, someone a little bit, not pragmatic, but you know, you have to deal with certain aspects of reality that you may not be like, but you have to deal with it. And, um, and you want to win when you start a movement, when you want to fight against uh, different eyes, you have to, you want to win something. And media is part of the strategy to win something. Uh, if I can use the 2012 strike as an example, when we started the strike, the government didn't want to talk to us. They didn't react a lot to the media. So there was this vast media space with the government completely away. Jump in and uh, spin our message. You know, you when you're um, when you're doing public relations, you can you know have contact with uh, I don't know if it's the correct term, but it's someone who works in the media and you know he's booking the, uh, the person for the inter interview in some shows, so you can talk to them. Uh, you can talk to journalists. You can leak information. You can leak news because a journalist are always uh, seeking for good news and to do a good thing. And, and you can have this relation of proximity that helps you, you know, jump in the public space and define your own struggle and define your, your, own, your own, own terms. And it was easy at the beginning in the 2012 strike because the government was doing nothing about it. They had the strategy to ignore us and they ignore the student movement for two months. It didn't work, but it gave us the opportunity to win a uh, debate in the media because they were sending students. It was the pro chosen high student, the Green Square, and they were a little bit dumb. <laughs> Honestly, they were not that incredible in the you know, debate. So, uh, and we had a pretty good person, really good, and uh, so we win a lot of debate, a lot of debate in the media, we're everywhere, so when you keep 
you know, go in space that are allowed to you and create the space. Uh, you can, after, after it's like, it's helping you building a mobilization because it's like a strategic use of the public space. Some will have an idealistic vision of the public space, like, oh, we are rational <coughs> and neutral, and it's a beautiful debate with democracy and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm sorry if you think like that. But uh, me, I have a more strategic, uh, I see the public space, space has a, an ideological space, and you are in war, basically. So your spokesperson is like the general, and <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm like a metaphorical kind of girl, so you know. Um, yeah. So you have Gabriel and his boy, or the general, and um, you have Jean Charest or Le Cochon, the uh, general of the other side, and you are like that. You are like warring in the public space. And everyone is seeing you, everyone, and you know, it's keeping uh, a bubble, you know, you have your manifesto, your demonstration, and uh, public, you know, public assembly, all that kind of stuff, so it's like, it's helping you uh, solidifying uh, a concrete movement, because it's like the symbolization of the movement and the solidity of the movement and people, they are, you know, they identify, they are identified. Yeah, identified to that. So it's helped maintain, you know, that big block of, uh, yeah. So um, for me, winning is, the, the goal is to win your things. And in that perspective, I think it's uh, a great, idea to, you know, uh, go in the mass media. But now I understand there is tension because uh, we're not just here to win a specific thing, but we're here to propose uh, a project, you know, that's beyond the tuition types or it's like environmental, uh, the way of living with each other, uh, the uh, economical system. So in that perspective, you can just, you know, build your strategy to win a small thing. You have to act like the alternative way of life you are proposing. So it's there that there is contradiction with the use, the professional use of uh, the media. And a way to, you know, absorb these contradictions is to have debate in own organization about how do you deal with, say, for example, personalization, the tendency of media to uh, take one person and personal, personalize all the struggle in that one person. But you know, it's a mass movement. So, for example, uh, as they, they have a system of multiple spoke person and women and men. So you try to not uh, focus the attention on somebody specifically, but not unless you do that, but the media, they have their own, their own format, and they want somebody, and they will take the best of the three spoke person you have, and this will become the chief in their mind, even if your organization don't have a chief. Now, so basically what I'm saying is you can try to resolve the contradiction, but you cannot really succeed on all, uh, all the aspects. Now, do you have to, you know, stop using the media because of that? I don't think so. Because it's more important to win for the students you are representing than to completely achieve the project you are seeking to, to achieve, if you know what I mean. So, um, so uh, yes, and another way to resort this kind of contradiction is uh, the power of the movement you have beside of you. The more you are, the more you are the real demo, the more longer you are in the strike, the more powerful you are in the street, the more you can define things 
more on your way. So it's for that that the media has an extension of a concrete movement. And just being in the media don't, don't make, makes you win, of course. But uh, uh, so that's how I see. The, so yeah. Now, uh, for the independent media, so you can do, you know, you can decide, I will build a mass media and with our own, um, we will build a, mass, a massive movement with our own media, you know. Uh, fuck that, we don't want to, uh, to uh, degrade our message in uh, a big, uh, the mass media, so we'll build our alternative media and try to talk to our people this kind of this way. Uh, I have a complementary approach. Um, I think it's great to have independent media, uh, but I see some limitation in that because um, my how can I put it? I like independent media when it's a professional way to do journalism because the problem is people in their mind they are relying on big corporations and big media corporations and they are relying on, on so-called journalists or on professional journalists and when, when you want to build a media that is independent and by independent I mean that is not owned by a business or by the government uh, one of the problems is uh, sometimes all the journalist ethics is, you know, pushed away. I mean, uh, by that, uh, some independent media are not really independent because they can be found, the funding can come from a political party, just from a political party, for instance, or a writing one or the funding can come from a Senate uh, and unions. So you don't really have an independence. And sometimes they have strategy with the publicity that, oh, uh, this corporation is giving me money, so I have to write you know, two or three articles that make the promotion of this corporation. And I've, I've seen it in, in, in independent media because the core question is how do you make money? when you are building something on the internet and you don't have the resources that mass media have and you don't have the viewership or you don't have the, you know, all that kind of stuff and sometimes people in that kind of media they, they are agreeing to some stuff that are in my point of view in contradiction with what journalism should be in his way of doing a good journalism and I'm not saying that all independent media are like that. They're, some of them are really good and some of them are, you know, they did they, they, they investigative form of investigating, investigative journalists that are pretty nice. But I'm just saying it's the, the degree. Because uh, I'm not professional journalists are not saying they are objective. Uh, nobody is saying that anymore. But uh, we have to respect a form standards, you know, like uh, checking the facts, uh, professionalism. Uh, you have to contextualize. Uh, like a journalist can be an activist, but uh, you don't have to blame the political sphere and the journalistic sphere and uh, so for that I think it's the mass media you can do critics and everything but they have a form of standards you know saying that this is true and this is not true and people rely a lot of that on that same and uh, another form of, of criticism you can do to independent media is that some of them, you know, are member of political party on a personal basis, or are 
you don't have, you know, a, a clear demarcation between uh, commercial sphere, political sphere, and the media. And I think it can be a problem to. Uh, and but uh, I will I have to do that pass away. And but I, I see some uh, some good points in uh, the citizen journalists and the independent media in that. Uh, professional journalists don't have the monopoly of creating sense, social sense, and, uh, and and they're not the only one that are saying true things, you know, and uh, it's okay to have other space of people who can, you know, go to places the journalists won't go, and sometimes it's happening, you know, when they have the, the Iranian revolution in 2012, the big corporation, the big media corporation, they were relying on info from demonstrators in, in the streets because the journalists cannot be here. So they are taking a picture, a video from people in the streets and they are making stories with that in the media. And it's, now I think the debate is to see how professional journalists and citizen journalists can blend together and work a little bit together to uh, so uh
dans la rue pour faire en sorte que le message soit entendu. Vous êtes toujours en direct avec Guy Sparks sur les ondes de www.kamaïdurmedia.org.
an electoral expense, yeah. not recognizing us as exempt under that rule uh, by virtue of being a media. We fought them and we won. They recognize us now as non-traditional media. So slowly, we're establishing ourselves. Uh, objectivity, and I'd like to talk a little bit about objectivity before I finish off. Uh, what is objectivity? You raised a good an issue earlier about the whole climate debate, where you know you have 99% of scientists who I don't remember how exact number, but you know, 99% of scientists who are in total agreement that we have climate change, yet on the TV, we're seeing both sides of the debate. And very few of these mainstream media are going after and saying, okay, these other scientists are against the, uh, you know, the whole existence of climate change. Is somebody paying them? Uh, who's funding their research? So for a lot of that research does come from the uh, So yeah, going back to what an independent media is. It doesn't really exist, but you know we can try our best because we just have to. I just lost my camera box too. Alright, so I think we can open this up a little bit. Um, about the, the objectivity of media, I think that objectivity is uh, an illusion because no one is really objective. Uh, so I believe that the thing to do, I, I believe that in the 21st century, uh, the big change that needs to happen in media is to recognize that we actually are subjective and to put forth that subjectivity as part of the job you're doing. So if you put it forth, at least people already know what your bias is on the subject. So you, you, you might want to try to minimize like the dependencies you might have, the, the biases you have, you're, you're gonna have, but you're never gonna erase completely the bias you might have as a media. So I think it's a good thing to actually recognize that so that the public is actually informed of what your biases are. And that's, for me, one of the things that the mass media is not doing and that the independent media is trying to do. I believe that the mass media are not more objective than the independent media, but they try to pass their information as something objective, whereas the independent media usually recognize they are activists and they try to bring some kind of life that's different from the mass media. So, like, I prefer my media independent, at least I know what I'm buying than what I'm seeing. When I went to school in journalism, G school last year, none of my teachers were, say, were saying, you are an objective person. Uh, it's true that in uh, part of the history of the media, in recent history, uh, the journalist and the teacher, they were saying, you are objective and you are neutral and all that kind of stuff. But now, since, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, um, the point is not being objective, it's being professional and it's more like integrate a scientific approach to the way you are dealing with reality. And it's really different, different, different that, that we are not pretending we are objective. But where I think you are right, uh, when I, yeah. Where I, I think you are right is when you are saying that uh, mass media, mainstream media, don't, they have a bias and they don't assume it. And I think it's true. And when you look at the media in France, for instance, they are way more than the analytical way to do journalism. They are not afraid to say, this is our perspective as a media, you have the Figaro. It's more right wing. You have the mall, it's more social democrat, you have liberation. And all these media they are like they have like their bias and they are assuming it for but they are staying professional. And my point is you have to get the facts straight and you don't have sometimes when you have you are doing activism, you are more like doing 
propaganda than you know describing the reality. And my major point is, is here: you can have a bias, but you don't have to do uh, uh, left-wing sensationalism. If I can put it that way. So. Uh, it's true that objectivity, especially in journalism, is not. Uh, Organizations tend to uh, claim that they're very objective, yet uh, by you know giving both sides of the argument always. But that's not really objectivity. Uh, if, uh, if again going back to the climate change issue, if, like you know that this person is false because of all the facts that exist, why keep bringing him into the debate? Uh, also, there's the choice of words. You can be reporting the news but still taking an opinion. It's how you choose your words, how you put them in order as well. You don't know, make it sound who started the fight first. If there's a fight, or, for example, but, yeah, not, uh, but yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. I think it's the bullet notion of how objectivity doesn't exist. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I did a research in one of my classes international information, where we uh, basically took three, uh, three uh, press agency uh, articles about something that happened in Jerusalem. And we compared the two articles. One was from Agence France Presse, the other one was from Associated Press, and the third one was from Xinhua, which is a Chinese uh, news agency. So basically we took these three articles and we compared them. The three of them were telling us facts, of course, they are objective but they're not telling the same facts. So none of the articles was in fact false, but if you want to get the full story, you needed to read the three of them, because otherwise something is amiss. Some things are omitted, be it you know, on a willing basis or on more of an unconscious basis, like what you see is what you write or whatever, I don't say, but it's, re it's really important to understand the fact that objectivity is this huge pretense for uh, media to tell us, like, we have the truth, and what we give you is the truth, which, when in fact, it's just another interpretation of uh, what's happening. Uh, honestly, maybe if people have questions, it's going to be easier to follow the questions if maybe you go to the mic that's right there. So uh, it's going to be easier for the mic.
uh, give more to their members or to uh, try to mobilize people? Or should they use it uh, to address the general public or, and to explain um, their uh, demands? And, uh, well, yeah. So, or both, or neither, or alternate, I don't know. That's a very important question that we did talk with at the beginning and uh, we, we decided early on uh, in the inception of 99% media to differentiate between what it is to be a media person covering an event <coughs> who also happens to be an activist and the difference between that and a person who is an activist with a camera. We're, we do not promote uh, protests or specific action events or whatever, but we do cover them. We tell a story about them. We try to frame them in, in, into uh, something comprehensive, rather than, you know, we don't do a call to arms. That's not the job of an media group, precisely. Not, not, not in that way, not in the call to arms, let's all go down to protest right now, there's a big protest, you should all go to it, blah, 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 no. We're more towards, okay, look, there is this problem. We need to talk about it. And this is what 99% media is very good at. It's, it's good at opening the debate on topics. Uh, our documentary sources, that we release them free to the public. Everybody can, and we even encourage people to have their own screenings, no matter where they are, wherever they want. And to have a discussion with everyone. And we go along with some of those screenings and, and not necessarily participate uh, in the debate itself, but, but let people talk between themselves. That's, it's very important. I think that for me, this is the main uh, significance of uh, being in the independent media is to open up the debate. Uh, that debate, which is usually on mainstream media, is uh, described as left and right, and you know, there's no middle and there's no shades of gray. Life is more complicated than that. Going back to ethics, uh, journalistic ethics, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, where is the journalistic ethics where mainstream media takes out a PR point from the SPVM word for word and puts it out as journalist news? Corporation, 
Now, how does that make sense for the police department to have a person to make sure that the image, the corporate image of the police, is maintained? Which means, to do that, the person who does it has to be a liar because it twists the truth. Uh, the other thing, uh, yeah, the highest, one of, the, one of the most democratic organizations in the uh, the Indigenous Group Director General of Elections, uh, recognized us as independent media, but the police doesn't. Every time we have a reporter on the ground who wants to go in where they have the media access to a protest or they can have a kettle or whatever, uh, they've been denied the last few times, no matter how much we try to check out and how we are legitimate people. <coughs> they don't want us going in because we're not one of the mainstream media journalists. And, well, to tell you a little story that happened not too good. recently, uh, the police held a, SPM held a meeting for producers from mainstream media. Not exactly journalists, but producers. Um, one media group, independent media group, managed to go in there to UTV. Uh, then they, so they told us pretty much what happened was police telling them how to report the protest. So, I don't know.
in San Diego, for the first is it doesn't necessarily mean that we are going to be generous. It just means that we perhaps in certain areas will have the freedom to do so more so than uh, the mainstream media has. So in that sense, perhaps, like, just because you're in the media, there's no guarantee that
and we curve the, the actual experience on the, on the field uh, to, to do this practice. So people who just like go to, go to, go to school and you know, learn what it is to be a journalist and pick up on some kind of So to me, there's no difference if I'm in the media or in the media, you can find professional career and you can find amateur career. Like I've seen people who graduated with me from the Bachelor of Journalism who don't know how to write. Like, if you, ask, if you ask them to write an article and they don't have, they didn't understand, they don't understand the notion, the simple notion of how to fire the first fire and they don't understand like that if they don't choose the right vocabulary to say something, people are going to read something else. So, amateurism and professionalism I don't think can be separated between like internal media and I agree with you, so I just want to take exception of the way we use the word amateur. This, seriously, even a professional can be an amateur. The, the, the word amateur is very beautiful. It's a person who loves what he's doing, he doesn't love it. It's, it's a professionalism. Uh, yeah, one thing about 99% media, and I'll just, we've been around like for three years, like I said, and uh, done a lot of work. We have this image of, strangely enough, of being a professional group that is very, very well funded and has full-time employees or, you know, doing miracles every day, you know. Hey, Simon, how true is that statement? Too much. <laughs> we all work on our free time. Uh, we, we all do this on this as well.
Facebook and Twitter mainly. Um, I think you can develop a few strategies. You can, um, the future is to uh, put in place some communicational strategies that are using a lot of features, you know, videos, uh, pictures, uh, the way you are writing the headline on a page, uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook page, uh, uh, in a way you are writing in a way that people they, they are interested. I'm not saying you have to do like a uh, like clickbait. I'm not saying that, but you can you know just formulate formulate it in a good way, and it's and also you can gather stories that are circulating on the internet and address it on, the, on your media platform and it's de facto interest to people on the internet. So you, you can, uh, I'm agreeing, it's, uh, it's a new, new way of um, making the, the information you know, flowing. And uh, you can also use it to make money to start your own media, like Ricochet is a new uh, Canada-based media, electronic media, and they are using a crowdfunding campaign to finance their media, and <coughs> they add a lot of money, but it, it, it's just on the internet that they can have money to finance themselves, and it's another way you can use it. Um, just, just one other thing, I think, about social media. Social media is like a, a new kind of media, just like, TV sort of took over radio and cinema. Social media has it on the internet the same kind of thing. It's just a different media. Well, social, uh, media is now, social media is now part of the internet. Social media is part of the
journal, uh, newspaper articles, and we can also uh, see some articles from sciences. Like uh, we are at in the university, we, we have access to these kind of articles, and like journal, uh, newspaper articles are just like the articles that that the people that studied in communication are, are, are writing, like, like people that have studied in, in biochemistry are, are doing biochemistry articles that they, they have their, the magazines that are not newspapers, so they that information is really spreading. And like people are kind of freelancer, but it was like an intuition to be back on it. But the, interest, the nice thing about the internet is that it's so good that if you want to check something, you can. I mean, can you imagine living in the 50s and 60s during the Cold War where you had to listen to the war propaganda that either side hated? It's like just one thing, you know, that's not interactive, it's just the other side is bad, nothing covered, and they're one cold. Corporate entities that, that try to keep them funded. 
for instance, this first thing is like, it's not being sponsored by some pharmaceutical. They're being sponsored by the government, not by their government employees. True. But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that she agrees with the government because she came out and spoke against the government. Can you truly say that they're meeting evidence of government though? It's, 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 it's a very valid question. I'm not contradicting it. No. I'm just saying that it, it, to see everything in that light would mean that we can't report anything anymore. Which is normal as that. What? Which is what John Hall said. Because then there's no such thing as a government. No. I mean, well, there, there's no such thing as absolute objectivity. That's true. But you still need to have that news analyzed. And it's always important to give, bring uh, multiple sides in. Like, see more than one source as well, just to be able to have a better picture of what's going on, because if you take a picture, yeah. Yeah. Which is so radically 
different that we can't even have like a common dialogue. Thank you. 